It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... No! Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life. On this Wednesday, June 15th, 2022. Hello again, everyone. I hope you're doing well on this beautiful, this lovely, this warm, this crisp. Ah, I love June so much. Wednesday afternoon in New York City. June, July. I mean, what's better? It's the Saturday of the calendar year. There's nothing better than June, July, especially in New York City. Everyone's in a good mood. I'm in a good mood. Loving life having a great time. In fact, uh, the four, I'm, I'm big on anniversaries. Uh, today, actually, the one year anniversary of the independent Helwani movement, June 15th. Also, the four year anniversary of this studio being unveiled. It was right after Mayweather McGregor was announced in uh, mid-June 2017. We unveiled this studio. The following week was big. We had Leonard Ellerbe on and all these people. We had a stretch of two and a half months I do recall in-studio guests every single Monday. It was tremendous stuff. Feeling good. So excited about today's show. Today's show has something for everyone. It's a very international show, if you will. We've got a representative from Australia, a representative from Brazil. We've got a representative from Mexico. We have a representative from America slash uh, Italy. And of course, we have a representative from the Czech Republic on today's program. I'm very excited. There's a lot going on. Uh, Four out of the five guests on today's show have never been on the program before. That is exciting. The other one just once before. So it's a fresh lineup for all the people out there who, oh, you always have the same people on. Oh, you can suck it for all the people that say, why didn't you have anyone on from UFC to say, oh. Well, I'd like to remind you that that fight card this past Saturday happened in Singapore. It's like 96 hours away from here, like by flight. So uh, a lot of people had to travel. And you'll be happy to know that three of the competitors that fought on Saturday's card technically Sunday morning are on today's show. So you can take your... Ew. Why didn't you have anyone on Monday's show? Ew. You can take that and shove it in your back pocket because we're going heavy today, my friends. A lot to discuss, a lot to get to. As always, this show is brought to you by our good friends over at DraftKings. DraftKings Sportsbook is the official sports betting partner of the MMA Hour and the UFC. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today. Use code the MMA Hour for a special offer when you sign up. That's code the MMA Hour only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Do you think, Frank, um, DraftKings would be okay if I did the ad read in that voice? Yeah, I think they would love it. Ew, this show is... I hear YouTube is a big fan. As for the rest of us. (laughs) Uh, This show, I, I feel like YouTube really likes it when I break out that voice. Any confirmation? Have you been manning the chat? No. Let's see what the chat has to say about it all. Don't do this to yourself. <laughs> I'm dead. It's making the chat cringe. Do it more. Uh, this is great. Keep triggering them, Ariel. I'm actually quite happy with this response, if I'm being honest. My neighbors are complaining, unsubbing. It was fun while it lasted. No more of that voice. Uh, Racket just from Australia. Apparently, I said that last show. Obviously, you know I meant Austria. Relax. Um... I feel like the more we address the chat, the better the chat is going to get because that, you know, makes everyone run away, run for cover. Ew. <laughs> Why do I enjoy doing that voice so much? I don't know. Anyway, today's show is going to be fun. We love Wednesdays here on the MMA Hour. Back into the show, moderator Lewis. Actually, I see he he sent me the questions at 1 p.m. I mean, the guy is just, uh, I don't know what, I, I don't know how I can repay him, but he didn't have to do it. He's unbelievable. Moderator Lewis, I was going to say hard at work, but actually his work is done. He is done. He has sent me the questions. So do we have a buzzer? Could we do like a, we have that sort of thing, like a, meaning like there's no, you don't, you don't have like a database like Fred Norris does, right, Jack? Not Jack. Why'd I call you Jack? Uh, uh, Frank, you don't have like a database of just like infinite sounds, do you? 
Oh, Frank is troubleshooting. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I guess he's just not at my disposal. Uh, but he says no buzzer. All right, fine. In any event, no more questions. We'll answer your questions on the nose back in the show around uh, 345. Around 330, I'm told GC has sent us another video submission from his uh, European vacation. We miss him dearly around these parts. We're counting down until he's able to rejoin us. Feels like the vacation has lasted you know, 45 weeks, but that's not us hating. That's not us projecting. That's not us, you know, being envious. That's just us missing. You have to understand where it's coming from. It's coming from a, a loving and warm place. In any event, he has his picks for this weekend, and I'm told he has sent us a video from wherever he may be. I can't wait to see that video. You'll recall last week, his video was incredible. It's one of the greatest things that we've ever had on the show. So I'm really looking forward to the video uh, this time around. Now, at uh, 3 o'clock, we're going to be joined by one of my favorite characters in MMA right now, Danny Sabatello. This guy is an absolute character. I mean, he is so much fun. He calls himself the Italian gangster. He's in the Bellator Bantamweight Grand Prix. He's fighting Leandro Higo on uh, June 24th. That's next Friday at Bellator 282 in the tournament. Cut a mean promo, one of the best promos of the year. A real character. If you're not familiar with Danny, trust me, you will love this guy in about two hours from now. Or you may hate him. You will feel some sort of way about him. I'll tell you that much. Uh, Tyler Santos is going to join us at 2.30, of course, coming off that disappointing loss to Valentina Shevchenko this weekend. Where did she go from here? How's the eye? All that stuff and more shall be discussed. Some guy named Yuri Prochaska is going to join us at uh, 2 p.m. The pride of the Czech Republic. You saw the scene on Monday. You know what happened on Saturday slash Sunday with the big win over Glover Chair. The brand spanking new reigning defending UFC light heavyweight champion is going to join us. Yuri Prochaska. I can't wait for that. And Thunder Rosa, a.k.a. Melissa Cervantes, is going to join us. Former Combate Americas, Combate Global uh, MMA fighter, current AEW Women's World Champion, going to join us. Great character, uh, big fan of hers. She's doing some stuff in the world of MMA and is also uh, doing something really cool for... Um, her community next to where she lives. We'll get into that when she joins us in about uh, 25 minutes from now. For now, though, I want to go to one of the rising stars in the UFC, just 25 years young, and uh, one of the breakout stars of 2022. He is 2-0 and in the UFC. If you count his contender series win, he's 3-0, and and he had a big, big win on Saturday, a big win over Ramazan Amiv. A first-round finish. His debut was somewhat similar. Actually ended at around the same time, a little less than three minutes. A first-round finish. He is the pride of Perth. He is Jack Della Maddalena, and he's kind enough to join us. It is currently 1 a.m. over there in Perth, and I always feel bad with the Australian fighters making you guys either wake up uh, very early or go to bed really late. I appreciate you, Jack. Thank you so much for doing this at this hour. Hey, Ariel. Pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a great pleasure, and congratulations on not only the win on Saturday, but everything you've done thus far in your career and in the UFC. 2-0 and now in the UFC, and, and I, I love your story. I love everything that you've been through, but I'm just asking, like now, I'm wondering, I should say, 2-0, and two finishes, first round, you're on a roll, you're being featured on pay-per-views. Is this exceeding your expectations? Like, did you think that when you got into the UFC, things would maybe go a little slower for you? Yeah, I did expect it to go slower, but I was hoping to have it as quickly as possible. And yeah, I'm blessed to be in the situation I am, but I think I want to keep rising and get to bigger and better places. How was Singapore? How did you enjoy fighting there? Yeah, it was really nice. It was very close to home. So a lot of friends and family made the trip. It's a pretty cool place. Very close trip. So it was nice to get in and get out and get back home. Yeah, my understanding is uh, it's about four hours from Perth, correct? Yeah, it was about a five-hour trip. Okay. Five hours, same time zone. Wow. That's amazing. As opposed to fighting in Anaheim in January, how long was that trip? It's six hours to Sydney and then a further 14 and a half hours Jeez. to LA. So it's a, especially when you add layovers in hotels or in Sydney airport, it just adds up. It's a long journey, but nothing like the Singapore one. And, and just curious, because I would imagine an American fighter fighting on this 275 card, they would just stay on American time because this essentially was 
cater towards us here in America happening, you know, Saturday night. But for you, morning time was morning time, like that same time zone. So how did you, you know, adjust to essentially having to fight in the morning? I was pretty blessed. We trained every day at 10 a.m. and my fight kicked off at 10 a.m. So it was pretty much a the perfect wow. perfect time zone for me to fight. Yeah, it was just a usual day of training. So just did pretty much stuck to my usual routine, got up early and got ready for training, really. But really this time it was just a fight. And and what time did you wake up? Just curious. I think I was up at 6 30. And that's not weird for you on the day that you fight. Like usually, do you like to sleep in? Yeah, normally I'll try and sleep in as much as possible. Normally, I probably wouldn't get out of bed before nine okay. o'clock on a fight day. But knowing that I was fighting in the morning, I wanted to get up and just get the my eyes cleared of all the sleep and just get ready to go. Uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm sort of uh, I'm sort of into noses. Uh, you know, they call me Helwani nose, El Nariz. I don't know if it's the uh, the shadows. But is your nose like, is it going? I've got a pretty bad nose. It's pretty much going. What's happening? Zigzag. It's like a thing. <laughs> it's, been, <laughs> it's been smashed. You know, I am going to get it fixed one day, but I just thought, hey, what's the point of getting it fixed now when my job is to get punched in it for a living? But I will one day. Okay. <laughs> when did that happen? It happened, um, I think it happened my second USC fight. Oh, sorry. It was my second MMA fight. I got kneed and straightened the nose and it, since that day, it's been facing the wrong way. Well, I think it gives you a lot of character. So, uh, I would suggest <laughs> not changing it. Uh, actually interesting that you bring that up. Your story is a really interesting one to me. You actually started your MMA career. zero and two, and I believe you were fighting as a middleweight at the time and you made a pact with your coach saying you're going to win your next 10 as a welterweight and you're going to make it to the UFC. In fact, now you're on a 12-fight winning streak. You haven't lost since. Is that accurate? Is that what happened? And if so, can you tell us about yeah. that conversation? Basically, yeah, lost my first fight and then went into another fight. And yeah, I had lost two fights. My coach wasn't there the second time around, but I called, we spoke on the phone and we thought I was better than being an 0-2 fighter and, yeah, made that pact to get to 10-2. and two. And it seemed like a massive goal at that stage to get 10 and wins in a row, but we just slowly worked at it and made it happen. And but, here we are. you know, 0-2, you start off your career 0-2. Is there any part of you that's like, I don't know, maybe I'm not cut out for this, maybe I shouldn't do this, you know, this isn't, you know. Like, yeah, of course. Yeah. You definitely have like a little bit down in your head thinking maybe this isn't sport for me if I – had have gone uh, zero and three, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. So it's just a matter of getting that that first win on the back. Um, yeah, getting that first win and then just going for the second win. So it was a slow process, but I still love the sport. I love training, and my coach put a lot of confidence in me that we could get to ten and two. So we just stuck to it. Uh, so that that next fight, the third fight, you won via KO. Um, just going into it, considering what you just said. A lot of pressure on your shoulder? Like, did you feel like if I don't win this, I'm done? Um, yeah, I guess there was a little bit of that pressure, but it was no different to any other fight. It was just at that point when you're locked into a fight, you don't really, well, I don't really think about all the extra pressure and all that. I just try and think of the task at hand. So it was just a matter of about getting that the, the job done. So no extra pressure than any other fight. But yeah, of course, knowing that if I was to lose that fight, I probably would not be where I am now, I wouldn't think. Who introduced you to MMA? Like, who got you into this as a profession? I've always, as, as a young age, I was into a bit of WWE and me and my oh, brother yeah. would do a lot of like, would wrestle a lot and play around. And as soon as I saw a video of MMA, I can't remember the first video I saw. It must have been like a YouTube video when I was 12, 11 or 12. At that point, I couldn't go back to WWE. I was sort of hooked on hooked on the MMA train and since then just been intrigued and just been training with my brother. Oh, who who was your favorite WWE guy back in the day? Like I was I like Shawn Michaels. Ah, oh, come on, <laughs> I man. Shawn I hated Shawn Michaels. He was my least favorite. Yeah, I, yeah, I like Shawn and probably my second was probably Kurt Angle. Oh, that's not those bad. Two. I was a big Bret Hart I, guy. I, I was Oh yeah, I was sort of a bit too young for Bret Hart. Okay, fair I, enough. I wasn't really around in that time. 
I mean, you're 25. You're just a young pup. It's unbelievable. You made your yeah. debut in 2016 in MMA. Um, all right. It's, and th but but then like you see MMA and you like it when you're a youngster. How do you go from liking it to saying I want to actually do this for a living? Like I want to be a pro fighter. Who who takes you down that path? I think um, to be honest, when I first saw it, I, I was really drawn to. It. I thought if there's any possible way if I could do this, I want to do it. And since then, I've been pretty obsessed with it. But to actually get in and start competing, I found finding my first MMA gym, which was actually the same gym I am now. Mm. Finding that gym really just showed me that it is actually something you can do if you want to compete in it. And then just as soon I would just wanted to compete as soon as I could. I had to wait a bit of time due to the where I'm from with the age of competition, etc. But yeah, as soon as I found the gym, I was ready to go. I was wanted to compete and get into it. What's that age? What's that cutoff? Is it 19? Yeah, 18. I think 18. at the 18, they were a bit... Yeah, they were, it was hard to get at the time. It was hard to get fights when you're under 18 in Western Australia. But I just waited, just kept training from... Came and went to the gym when I was probably 14 or 15 and just spent many, like four or five years focusing mainly on mixed martial arts the whole lot. And then four to 18... Uh, obviously, there have been a bunch of legends who have come from, you know, your neck of the woods, the likes of uh, Mark Hunt and 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 George Sotiropoulos back in the day and, you know, Bam Bam and Whitaker and uh, Volkanovsky. But Perth in particular, where you're from, not a ton of guys have come from there to the UFC, right? Were, were there, I know Volkanovsky was there a little bit recently, but are there other, you know, guys from back in the day that you train with or now are you one of the biggest to to break through from that area? Uh, there was a couple of guys. Like, I have never trained, but Saul Pillay was. Oh right, Perth, yeah, okay, Perth. yeah. And then Steve Kennedy. Okay, yeah. He's from Perth. He had a few fights in the UFC, but yeah, I trained a bit with Steve when I was younger and saw that he could do it. Get there, I knew it was possible because there was other Australians getting to the big leagues and doing well. So yeah, I've definitely always thought it was um, a possibility to get to the UFC and compete with the best, and I just stuck to it. Now I have to say uh, I have a lot of uh, you know respect and admiration for your manager Tim Simpson. I think he's one of the best in the game. And when he brought you into the UFC and got you in, he he told me right away, look out for this guy, this guy. And I think if I'm being honest, he might be a little biased. I believe he's from Perth as well, and he has a soft spot in his heart for the uh, the fellow Perth fighters. But when he refers to you, when he talks about you, he keeps referring to you as Don Giacomo. And I'm like, who's this Don Giacomo that you keep talking about? He's like, I can't, you're going to watch him on the card? I'm, I look at the card. I'm like, I don't see a Don Gi Giacomo here. So what is going on? He, it seems like he's trying to get you to change your name or have a new nickname. And it, I don't know if it's catching on, to be honest. Yeah, now my full, my full name is Giacomo Della Maddalena. Wow. That's uh, a tremendous name. A, yeah, I know. Beautiful name. <laughs> I've just stuck to um, stuck to Jack just simply because it's simpler for people, and it's just sort of stuck with me my whole life. How do you but feel about Don? Like How do you feel about Giacomo. Don? <laughs> you like that name, Don Giacomo? Hey, I don't. Yeah, I guess it is my it is my my actual name, so I do enjoy it. Can I be honest with you? I feel like you need to rock with I mean that, that is a name that sticks out. Yeah. It sticks out, my friend. It's it's memorable. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll make the move. Now, I think it's just easier, Jack. It gets too much of a tongue twister. All right, fine. And is it is it Mad Madalena or Madalena? Madalena. Madalena. Uh and so is your family of Italian descent? Yeah, my granddad was born in Italy. And then that, yeah, the rest of my family is Australian, sort of, like my mum's side is mainly Australian, English sort of background, and then granddad was, made the move from Italy as a young man. Okay, and does your brother fight professionally as well? Yeah, my brother does. And uh, what's his record? Record four and two, professional. Okay. And uh, what, yeah. what, what, what weight? Middleweight. He's uh -oh. fought a world to weight, but he's a, tall, a bit tall. He's more of a natural middleweight, I believe. Okay. Uh, and I understand recently you got married, and you're also expecting your first child in July. Yeah, so big big things coming here. Golly. Baby at the end of July, and hopefully a fight soon after. 
Well, let me tell you something. July, best month of the year to be born. Only, at least for us here in America, only I, I think it might be different over there in Australia, but it was the only month. I'm I'm a July baby as well, July 8th. Only yeah. month out of the year, no school. So it's kind of like the Saturday of the calendar year, if you ask me. But I think yeah. your 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 school calendar is different, right? Your summer break is in December. Yeah, the in yeah, they take December, January off. So okay, sort right. of right. Yeah. Now, like fighting now in the UFC and things are rolling for you and you're about to become a dad and you just became a husband. Do you feel like you're fighting for, you know, a greater purpose now? Like there's more more at stake when you go out there as opposed to just fighting for yourself? Uh, to be honest, this time being child-free, it, didn't, it felt pretty much similar, but I guess I'll figure out next time. I'm sure there'll be a little bit of an extra kick. Yeah. When the baby comes, I'll feel a little bit more motivated a little bit more of a, yeah, someone relying on me completely, but see how we go. Do you, do you know the I'm sex sure of the baby? No, we're going to wait, get a surprise. I like it. I did that for all three of my kids. Surprise. Uh, There's very few surprises well, we in life. You know, you yeah, might as well do it. Point. Yeah, exactly. Now, if you have a uh, you know, boy, girl, whatever, and they say in 15 years, they want to be a fighter like their old man, would you be okay with that? Yeah, I think I would. I think saying sitting here now without a baby, I think I would be okay with it. Okay. I'd obviously have to teach them that you just you might want to make sure that they're fully invested and they're not going to hurt themselves. But I think you've got to let let them go for it. I, you know, I think it's weird when people say no, but I can understand why they would say no if only because, you know, they've been through the game. The fight game can be brutal. It can be ruthless. Uh, but more often than not, I, I hear parents who are fighters say the same. Uh, you mentioned you want to get a fight shortly after that. You just fought. So what are you looking? You're looking to get back in there in like August or something? Um, I've, I've got to pass it past the life. <laughs> they, I know they're doing a show. In, <laughs> I know they're doing a show in Paris in September. Yeah. I don't know if that is too close to the arrival of my baby, but yeah, maybe September, October would be work out well for me, I believe. And then hopefully squeeze one more in at the end of the year. Wow. So you're looking for four this year. I would, yeah, I'd love to, I've said from the start, I'd like to have four this year and I still think it's in possibility if I can get a fight in September, October, I don't know. I don't really know. I haven't looked at the schedule or anything. Yeah. I'm just sort of flinging numbers, but I think a fight, Every two, three months for the next six months makes sense. And is there a reason why Paris? No, really, just because it, it seems like a cool place to go and have a fight. Yeah. <laughs> Close to Italy as well, where your your family. Yeah, is. yeah, exactly. Uh, anyone come to why? mind? No, not really. I haven't really looked at the who in war. Well, I'm not going to call anyone out. I don't think that's. I don't know if that's the way it works at this point, but why not? I'm just happy to fight. <laughs> I always want to fight big, bigger and better competition, to be honest. Anyone better than the last guy is good to me. Do you feel like you have reached a point where like bottom half of the, you know, a top 15 guy makes sense, 15, 14, or not quite yet? Uh, if that is a possibility, hell yeah, I'd be into that. I'd be into the best ranked guy I can. Yeah. If I could get a top 15 guy now, I'd be absolutely be on the moon. Right. Well, I feel like you have a ton of momentum behind you and, and, and yeah. they're putting you on these big cards. Like they're putting you on pay-per-view cards. Um, why not? Top 15 guy would be incredible. Yeah, why not? I'm, I'm down, up for the challenge. I want to make it happen. So yeah, let's top 15 guy. Let's do it. I'm looking. I mean, why can't you fight Michelle Pajeda? Yeah, why not? He's an exciting fighter. He brings crazy, crazy sort of style to the game. I'm in. Is he top fifty? Is he? Top he's fourteen. 15? He's fourteen. Yeah, he's an exciting fighter. He's got a cool style. Be up for the challenge, man. But yeah, anyone, honestly, anyone in that top fifteen would be incredible if that's a possibility. Number thirteen, by the way, Tim won't like this. Is Li Jingliang, who's one of his guys. But I mean, why can't you fight him? You've earned your spot. I know. Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, yeah. I think. This is uh, as long as they're not on my fight team, then let's do it. Are you the only one from your fight team in the UFC right now, or fighting in these you know big North American yeah, promotions? At the moment, I got a I got a good good guy from Perth actually fighting on contender series. This um, 
this time around in August, Stephen Ersig spends a lot of time with us. He's from Perth. He's very good. Uh, and and, series and when's that? Exact date. Uh, August, I believe. I think. Okay. August. Will you be helping him out, cornering him? No, your baby's going to be born. Uh, yeah, I won't be cornering him, but I'll definitely be in his corner, if you know what I mean. He'll yeah. Be spending time in the gym. And yeah, I'll definitely be tuning in. I can't wait for that. Well, uh, you have been delivering, my friend, and uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch you fight now twice in the UFC, also the Contender Series fight. And if you could get four in, I mean, we may be talking about you by the end of the year as one of the uh, the breakout fighters of 2022. You are certainly uh, one of those names as far as the first half of the year is concerned. So uh, congratulations, not only on the victories, but the wedding uh, or the marriage, the, the, the upcoming birth. It's going to be a great time for you and your wife. And uh, thank you again for staying up so late. Did you stay up late or did you wake up? I feel like you stayed up, right? Uh, I actually had a little, like probably 30 minutes sleep. I fell asleep. Oh no, <laughs> Jesus. I'm yeah, sorry. Here, but no, a pleasure. It's been great talking to you. I think appreciate it a lot. Cheers, Ariel. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. All the best to you guys. Beautiful. Thank you. Have a nice night. Enjoy yes. Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> there he is. Don Giacomo. Uh, Giacomo della Maddalena. Jack della Maddalena. That's a great name. That is a tremendous name. I can see why Tim is uh, pushing for that. Giacomo della Maddalena. I mean, you see that name off the bat, and you're like, this guy is definitely from Italy. Um, family from Italy. Repping Perth. 2-0 in the UFC. Pete Rodriguez back in uh, January on the Nganu Gan card. And uh, Ramazan Amiev back in June, earlier this week. Well, technically last week in Singapore. Uh, UFC 275, just a few days ago. Ew, you didn't have any fighters from the 274. For some reason, the voice has kind of morphed into some sort of like British accent. I'm not really sure why, um, but I'm looking forward to his evolution and progression as a mixed martial arts fighter and a UFC fighter. Uh, in a matter of moments, we're going to be joined by another. So we've got the Pride of Perth, Giacomo della Maddalena. I feel like we have to go with that. Pride of Mexico, Thunder Rosa, the AEW uh, Women's World Champion from Tijuana. See how you say that? Tijuana. It's like Jorge Tijuana. Uh, we've got the Pride of Czech Republic, Yuri Prochaska. Got the Pride of, it, of uh, Brazil, Tyler Santos. And then you got the Pride of Italy, sort of Danny Sabatello. Matter of moments, we're going to be joined by Thunder Rosa, Melissa Cervantes. Big deal in the world of pro wrestling. But before you hit me with the, oh, why do you have pro wrestling? She's an MMA fighter as well. She competed for Combate Americas in November of 2019. Unfortunately, lost via decision. But she's the real deal, Holyfield. Uh, she has stepped through that cage door, so to speak. And we're going to talk to her about a bunch of stuff. And she's going to be doing some stuff for Combate Global in the coming weeks. But the biggest thing that she is doing is uh, she is auctioning off her AEW championship ring gear uh, online right now at gspawn.com slash Thunder Rosa. gspawn.com slash Thunder Rosa. And all the proceeds from this auction, I'm going to read it right here are going to the families and victims of the Uvalde school shooting. The funds will be donated to the Victims First, which is victimsfirst.org um, charity, a registered 501c3 organization that dedicates themselves to making sure all donations go to the affected families. So there it is, gspawn.com slash Thunder Rosa. She lives 45 minutes away from Uvalde. Uh, she's very involved in the community and she wanted to do her part. So... There are two days left, a little over two days left in this auction. Gspawn.com slash Thunder Rosa. Uh, it's her ring-worn gear from the 2022 Women's uh, AW Women's World Championship match at the Double or Nothing event in Las Vegas where she successfully defended her title. And right now the highest bid is $5,000. $5,000.
So this is what the auction winner will receive. Uh, the it's a, it's an amazing piece that she walked out to, and she had uh, should have had the photo up. That's my bad. Walked out with the uh, with the word Uvalde on on her chest and the a big heart there. A really incredible. I mean, this is what she looks like, by the way. Could we get one of her photos? How, like how she looks when she competes. It's it's really one of the 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 coolest looks, the best looks in pro wrestling right now. Um, especially I like when she does like the half face paint, but it's the whole outfit, the robe, the leotard, the black trunks, the pair of boots. I mean, look at that. How badass is that? That's an incredible look right there. Face paint, there's glitter, uh, eight by 10 photo, really, really impressive stuff. So that's uh, gspawn.com slash Thunder Rosa. Uh, that's where you can bid. A little over two days left. And again, all the proceeds go to victims first. And uh, that is going to the families and victims of the Uvalde school shooting. She's one of my favorite right now in pro wrestling. She's on fire. She's got a big chip on her shoulder. She's an MMA fighter as well. She represents Mexico. She represents the Hispanic community here in the United States. And you know, I am big in the Hispanic community as well. I am big in the Lucha Libre scene. They refer to me as El Nariz. So I feel like when I speak to Thunder Rosa... El Nariz has to come out as well. And so here we are. Let's say hello to Melissa Cervantes, a.k.a. Thunder Rosa. Thunder Rosa. Thunder Rosa. <laughs> what do you think, Melissa? What do you think? I love it. I love it. It's uh, it's great. I love the colors. I, I, I love it. You You look absolutely amazing. They refer to me as El Nariz in Mexico. Why would I be? Because you have a small nose? <laughs> no, I have a big nose. Look at this thing. It's sticking out. Oh, you're joking? Now people say... No, no. So, you see, some people say they should be La Nariz. This is my twist on things. El Nariz. All right? That's oh, the way I like to do it. I love it. I'm big over there. I went to... I, I, went to I, got, I got this from a AAA event back in the day. Do they do? They actually created that mask mask for you. They stopped the whole thing. They were throwing roses in my honor. I mean, the whole show shut down. It was unbelievable. Oh, Just God. for me. Yes. Um, I, I was secretly. That must be nice. It was very nice. I was secretly hoping that you'd come on with the face paint as well, and we can kind of go tit for tat, but no face oh, paint. Oh man, no! I I actually was doing a taco vlog right now, so it was oh. kind of hard for me to come with my you know face paint and wake up early because I had to I had to go work out and like run take a shower and then. Go immediately to do a vlog. So okay, it's, it's right. mornings on Wednesdays are busy. I, I get it. Yes. And I appreciate you doing this on a Wednesday because you have AW Dynamite tonight. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, live tonight beginning at 8 p.m. on TBS. So thank you so much for uh, yeah. squeezing us in here. You're the champ. Uh, you're the women's world champion over there. You're killing it right now. You're on fire. But uh, you're also doing a great thing for your community. So I want to talk about all these things. Let's start there. Most importantly, we, I just plugged the website a couple of times. gspawn.com slash Rosa. Can you explain what you are doing and why you are doing this? So, as you guys know, a couple of weeks ago, there was a terrible, terrible, terrible incident in uh, Uvalde, Texas, and where 19 kids were, you know, murdered and two teachers died after someone came and just, you know, did something unspeakable. And um, this happened when I was in Las Vegas getting ready for for my one of my biggest matches in my career for Double or Nothing. And, uh, and I was already having ideas of why I was doing the year that I was doing because I was going to represent all the terrible stuff that happened in Mexico with women because they're disappearing. There's 750 women that have disappeared in the last two years. And this happened. And I said, this was happening or about to happen. I was giving a, um, a, a speech to fifth graders in Las Vegas and a predominantly you know Latino community school and telling the kids how for some of them, school has been like the safest place for them. And now that's completely taken away. I mean, when I heard the news, my media director, Tony Allen, he called me crying. And he's like, do you know what happened? I'm like, no, what's going on? Because I'm not on social media. It's something else people think. You got to go on social media and see what happened. He's like, kids were, were killed. There's a school shooting in Uvalde. And I know it's like 45 minutes away from your house. And then and, and I just like start reading it and start seeing the news and everything. And it's just gave me chills to talk about it because... Um, these are kids that had dreams, that had uh, goals, that had families that love them. Um, and now these kids are no longer here with us and their families are suffering tremendously because of the loss, because of the trauma, because everything has had happened in, in one moment, right? And 
that day on that Tuesday, I decided that I was going to auction my gear to like raise money for the families, for whatever they need, because moving on forward for the next 20 years, 30 years until they leave this earth, they will continue to have the pain that they have to put their kids, you know, to rest, which is something that no parent should go through ever. Amen. And so you're you're auctioning off the gear that you wore at Double or Nothing. You successfully defended your title uh, that night at that event. And again, the website is gspawn.com slash uh, Thunder Rosa. And I went through everything that will, you know, go to the winner right now. There's a little over two days left and the current highest bid is uh, 5,000. So hopefully we can exceed that. And I commend you for doing that. Uh, you obviously don't have to. It's uh, it's it's an amazing thing that you're doing and it says a lot about you. Um, and I think speaking of, you know, saying, I, I feel, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, one thing that I think a lot of people relate about you and, and see in yeah. you and f- is you have, a, even though you're the champ, Nothing has come easy for you. Nothing has been handed to you, but you have a ma- you have a chip the size of freaking Texas on your shoulder. Still, even though you're you're at the top of the game, is that accurate? And why so? Listen, Ariel, it's it is very accurate. Uh, I feel like there is I'm the first of my kind, Ariel, in in this business to have come this far the way that I have come. You know, I I was brought up. You know. By myself, with you know, I'm not a, no second generation. I am not your young wrestler. I am not your typical, a stereotypical look of a, how a professional women wrestler should look like. Um, I am the first Mexican board ever to win a championship, a major championship in the world like this. So um, I continue to have a chip on my shoulder because I feel like some people don't put respect on my name. And they still, even now that I carry the title with me, I still people, you know, continue to say things about my my line of work. But I can tell you one thing. I work so hard and I continue to work much harder to keep the title and continue to build the championship, continue to build a strong women's division and continue to build something that is going to be there for decades after I leave this, this world. And it's like a legacy of someone who of service, of someone who was there for other women and was there to empower one way or another. If they don't agree with my methods, they don't like me, fine. But one thing I'm going to tell you, I will never going to stop fighting. And if anyone wants to get this title and there is an open challenge, they're welcome. I deal with my problems in the ring all the time. That's why I'm on top. And if somebody has a problem with that, they know where to find me. They know where to find me. And that is in that ring on AEW. Wow. I love it. Why do you think people don't put respect on your name? I don't know, man. I don't know. It could be a plethora of things. A plethora of things. But I said, that's the kind of thing that has driven me since I started day one. I've never changed and I continue to be the same way. Working hard until there's nothing left in me. It's going to take me, again, blood tears and pain to take this t- t- uh, championship away from me. That's what's going to take. That's what it took me to win it. That's what it's going to take me to lose it. Mm. So for anyone that, you know, wants to speak big game, come at me, baby. Life has thrown me every single thing that is on the book. And I'm still here fighting every single day from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. And I don't do it just for myself. I do it for my family. I do it for my, for my tribe. And I do it for, you know, I do it for Texas and I do it for all those Latino women that the whole entire life had told that they can't do nothing and they're not going to amount to nothing. I will continue to do it for them and I continue to do it for every woman that have been told, has been told no. I'm just going to keep doing it because this is who I am and that's why they call me La Mera Mera. It's not a gimmick. It's the real me. Uh, speaking of that, before anyone is like, oh, uh, this is just, you know, pro wrestling talk, this is all... I, this is legit. As they say in the business, this is a shoot right now because you know we like to keep it real here, Thunder Rosa. I, I get ready for the interviews. I look what people are saying. I see a lot of people slandering your name right now online, saying that you were stiff, you sandbagged Marina Shafir. What is going on here? Because I feel like, and I see people liking tweets, and I feel like people are not respecting the champ. All right, so what, what is happening here? Where is this hate coming from? And can you address that? Is that true? Did that really happen? No. And I like I and I, I'm gonna say it like how I said in the New York Post. I have nothing by respect for my opponents, 
nothing but respect for my opponents. Any Because anyone that dares to stay in the ring with me, I have nothing but respect to my opponents. And I send them nothing but blessings. And I will, like I said, moving on forward, I will continue to work harder to have the best matches I can bring and to bring the most opportunities for all the women that are behind me. So when they step in the ring with me, they're like, okay, cool. People, like I said, people are going to talk and that's fine. I'm not worried about that. I will continue to move forward and I will continue to show with my body of work what am I all about. So I have to say. Okay. Um, you are legit in the sense that you are a, a tough woman. You have fought before. You have competed in MMA for Combate Americas as uh, Melissa Cervantes. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Cervantes? Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes. And what is interesting about that, after I read more about your background, it seemed to me like you were not getting the opportunities that you were looking for or thought that you had earned in the world of pro wrestling. And MMA was almost just like, a detour and you're like, look, if I can't make it here, maybe I can make it over there. I'm tough. I like this. I can do it. I can commit. Is that what happened? Like you didn't necessarily want to become an MMA fighter. It was more, there was some frustration here and you went this route. Yeah. I think, uh, I didn't feel like people were respecting me or like giving me the legit legitimacy as a professional wrestler, as I felt like I had. And I think, um, jumping into MMA at such an older age, I was 33 when I started doing this. Um, it was a challenge for me and it was a mental challenge. And it was also uh, something that I knew it didn't matter if I win or lose that I was going to win no matter what, because it was going to bring another side of me that I'd never, you know, explore before. And it was going to push me to my limits, my mental, my physical, and my spiritual limits, which it really did. And, um, and I'm really blessed that I, I had the opportunity to, to do that and that I was uh, able to, uh, build another family with the MMA community in my in in my town in San Antonio, and I met so many wonderful people. And now, like you know, I I met like Chris Cyborg. I went to like her training mm. facility. I can name other people too that I have met, and I just have nothing but respect to these women because they've done it for decades. And it's not an easy and it's not an easy road. Being in a fighter is not an easy road because it's underpaid. Um, Women have to go through so much crap. There's not a lot of opportunities either, and even in the low in the lower division, because there's not a lot of fighters. Like with 115, there's very, very few in, in, in my area. So you have to go to so many different places and and like leave everything behind so you can get the best training that you can for your camp, so you can get ready, you know, to kick ass and win and, and win fights. Because it's it's there's nothing worse than you train so hard, your 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 camp went really well, and you keep losing and you keep losing and you keep losing. There's nothing worse than that feeling, right? And it's just like people don't understand the sacrifice, financial sacrifice, uh, you know, all, all the stuff that you have to go through. Like sometimes you have to like leave your family behind. If you have kids, it's like bringing your kids with you and training is like 110 degree weather. And, and your kids are like dying there. Like every time you have a break, you got to like, OK, baby, it's OK. Put it back down and just get back to the punches. I've seen it with a lot of my friends and our moms. And it's not an easy road. Just like I was talking with 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 professional wrestling, like fighting is not an easy is not an easy road, you know, and like. And I carry my 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 bruises and I carry my 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 cuts and everything with pride because you know it, it's a sacrifice and and I and I'm really blessed and I'm really happy that Combate America before or Combate Global now they gave me an opportunity to step in as a rookie that I was and I'm still am into you know uh, a professional. In the, prof in the professional state, like a lot of people do a lot of um, amateur fights. I didn't have the chance to do that. Didn't have the time to do that. I was working on the weekends as a professional wrestler in training MMA Monday through Friday. Wow. I couldn't even move some days because of the pain that I I went through on, on as a professional wrestler. I remember a month and a half before my fight on September, one week I had 10 matches. And I was freaking out because I didn't get to train for, I didn't get my MMA training then. And I was like, man, I, I can't do this. But I had to put money on my table. And fighting wasn't paying for it. I had to pay for it. I didn't have big sponsors. I didn't have nothing, man. It's like, you you, you like really go for the, for the purse, right? It's, it's a struggle, man. But I was like, this is not going to defeat me. I'm going to go there in there and give my, my very best, whatever that is. And every time I watch that fight, I cringe because I was like, now I see it and I'm like, no, I would have done this differently. I, because now I understand. Like when I first got in, I didn't understand. It's like wrestling. It's your first match. It's usually 
not the best. And um, it was my best performance at that time. And I was really proud that I wasn't, I didn't tap out and I didn't get knocked out. It went, you know, to, to the session, which is actually really good for somebody like me. But, you know, in, in retrospect is like, I knew I was tough, but that showed me that I'm tougher than I thought I was. Because jumping in like that at such an old age and watching all my friends have that been doing it for decades, I was like, well, this is going to be hard, but I already signed up for it. So might as well go for it, you know, with all the marbles. And if I lose, I lose. And if I win, I win. Was the plan always just one? No, it was, I was supposed to do more, but, um, yeah, um, COVID happened. I was training right. for my fights and COVID happened. And um, and I just wasn't able to do it anymore. And it kind of broke my heart because I was like, I was I was seeing strides. I was seeing some progress. And then that happened. And then I had to I, I focus on my career, which was professional wrestling. I definitely, and I said it multiple times in other interviews, I, um, I want to have one more fight if possible, if my time permits, you know. Fortunately, I'm really busy right now with 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 being right. a champion of a major company. But it's like I have that itch. I, it's just like it gives you, it, you you know, and you probably talk to a lot of a, a lot of fighters. It's like having that edge is like th- that adrenaline that you get when you're in the cage and the feeling that you get that you're, I mean, you're invisible, but invincible, but you not. But it's just like that right. moment of the, the fog, the, the lights, everything, the people, the, the the smell of the blood, the smell of the sweat, like every punch that you don't feel and like every kick, everything, like not knowing what's going to happen is just what makes it even like, I want to jump in there again. So in a perfect world, you do have one more fight in you, at least one more. You'd like that. We'll say so, yeah. I mean, everybody's like, you're crazy. You don't want to do it. You're kind of old now. <laughs> no, you're not. You're 35, right? <laughs> you're good. You're, what? You're 35, right? Yeah, I'm 35. That's yes. you're young. Yes. You're a young pup. <laughs> and you'd be, yeah, it would so be a much I, bigger deal if you, like, now you're this huge established name. It'd be a huge, you'd be the main event. No, 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 no. Don't make me the main event. Why? You know, I let's let respect my homies. No, I mean, you, you know, I mean for sell tickets, yes, but I want to respect my 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 peers who have been in the business longer than I have. And I mean, they put me at semi main last time, and I was like, yo, like this is like, yeah. you know, I'm pretty nervous now. You know, it's just a big deal. Um, I mean, if it is main event, it is main event. But I, like I said, I have nothing but respect for all my my associates that are in MMA that have been fighting for years. And I, I never want them to think that I'm being disrespectful because I'm not, you know, it's like, that's the thing when people come from and jump from one uh, area to another, they're like, well, why is that person getting that opportunity? It's just the business. Right. But again, I want people to understand I'm very respectful and I know the grind and it's not an easy grind. And I have nothing but respect to all my friends who are every single day, they wake up at six in the morning to go to jits class. Then they go to work. Then they go to sparring. They have to go to home, take care of their kids, take care of their families, take care of themselves. I know the hustle. I, I know the struggle. And, um, but again, like you said, if they put me as a man, you know, like, I'm just gonna be like, all right. But they know there's a lot of respect for my, my peers. Well, I said it, not, not you, of course. And you will be returning <laughs> to Combate uh, next month. I, I want to let everyone know they've got their English shows on Paramount Plus Friday, July 15th, Friday, July 22nd, you will be working as a color commentator for them. So, I mean, this is a big deal. Yes. You're coming back. Yes, I'm so excited. I am super excited because this is another uh, face that people don't see. I have done commentary in Spanish for AEW. I, now I work for a busted open radio. I do radio. Um, uh, and, and now I'm going to do commentary for MMA, which, you know, again, I'm super ready to like learn new stuff, to like meet the fighters, to research about the fighters, just to get back in there and just and just feel it again. Um, again, is like Combate Global has such a special uh, place in my heart because my first fight was in San Antonio. I won my my match, my main match in San Antonio. And now I get to like travel with them and do all this stuff. So, yeah, um, most definitely, I am super, super happy for this opportunity. And I want to thank Mr. Campbell and Mike for, you know, reaching out and doing this. I know they want me to fight, but because of my, you know, time constraints, unfortunately, I can't make it right now. But yes, uh, um, and then, you know, start getting another market that I haven't been able to, like, 
get back and like maybe get some of those viewers to come and watch AEW on Wednesdays. I think it will be super awesome. Yes, and vice versa. The AEW viewers come and watch you yes, on Combate yes, as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the most important part. Like the scope promoting part is is very very important. Uh, I love your story. Um, in short, you know, we don't have to do a this is your life here, but, you know, you, you were working as a social worker with teenagers, right? And the name of the yes. the facility was Thunder Road. And you guys were thinking of a cool name that would honor that, but also honor your heritage. So you come up with Thunder Rosa, which is a tremendous name. And it's also a fun name to to chant as well. But the, the, the attire that you represent, and in particular, the face paint, I love as well. Could I ask... Does the face paint in particular represent, I mean, obviously I know, you know, there, there's, there's the, the lucha aspect. There's the, I'm totally going to butcher this, but like the muerte something, I don't know. Am I, am I totally wrong about that? Anyway, could you tell yeah, me what, yeah, something. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. El Nariz isn't wearing his mask, so I don't have all the things. Uh, <laughs> but, what, what is it? What does it uh, all represent? And also if you could tell me how long does it take to put that on every week? Because it looks very, very detailed. Well, I'm going to start with what it represents. Uh, again, one of the main reasons why I, I'm doing the oh, Uvalde things is because, and I put Uvalde in the in the sacred heart, is because I, as I was fighting that match, I was fighting for those who didn't make it. And I was representing them in the most positive way, how their parents remember them. And that's how I represent. I represent all of those who have were in this world, all the kids that I work with when I was in Thunder Road. And unfortunately, they're no longer with us. They either, you know, committed suicide, they're murdered by the police, they died for, you know, tragic circumstances or just in general, like they were not able to make it out. I am representing all their wishes and desires and dreams and hopes and goals that they were never able to accomplish. And I'm representing it in the ring every time I step in there because everybody told me that I wasn't going to make it and everybody told me I was never going to be successful. And now I have an army with me, the Thunder Army. The dead and the alive people, and they all come with me. I've never come alone to the ring. Even when I'm alone, I'm never alone. Respect. Respect. I love it. I love when you also go half face. Is there a reason for that? When it's not the full face. I like the half face very well, much. The full, the full face is when I go full ham, right? It's, okay, all right. All right. I mean business. All I mean right. business. Half, it was because the promoter that gave me that, he said I was too pretty to wear full face. Oh. So he's like, show your two sides. So that's the answer for that. And how long does it take me to do my, my makeup? Depends on how intricate it is. It could take half an hour or it could take an hour and a half. Damn. Yeah, it depends. Because we have to put, you know, like the little jewels, this and that. So, um, so yeah, so it's, um, it's a little, it's a little complicated, but, um, but it is, it's pretty cool. I, I, I love it. Um, I love what I represent and I love that, um, that I'm one of the very few women, Latino women, that have been able to be themselves mm. in a professional wrestling level, right? And 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 that I am accepted by, by by, because that's when I got hired at AW, they hired they wanted to hire Thunder Rosa for who she was, mm. which I'm, I will always be very thankful to Tony Khan for doing that and for for allowing me to be me. Considering your long road, you know, six years indies, I believe that you had accepted a job as a referee with WWE and uh, kind of did it begrudgingly, but then there's a hurricane and your flight gets canceled and you take the detour to MMA and then you finally get this shot and now you're champion. <laughs> Was there a point that this, you know, seemed like the impossible dream? Like now are you living out something that at one point you had pretty much given up on and thought would never happen for you? Yeah, definitely. Like I, I wake up every morning, no matter, like I said, no matter how the odds are and like how difficult it could be sometimes. I wake up every morning uh, being blessed and, and thanking, you know, my higher power for allowing me to, to dream, live my dream and and help others. Like now my son is is becoming a professional wrestler. We're going to have a match this what next Saturday together. How old is he? You know, he's 17. He's about to be 17 in August. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, so it's like, it is amazing. It's like what mother can say that she's doing something as this with their son, you know, and it's passing it on. So um, it's, I don't even have words, man. I don't even have words. And I know, like I said, all those uh, trials and tribulations that have been put in my life is because I know there's a bigger purpose and there's a bigger thing for me and for my family and for those who are around me. Um, like I said, this is, 
this journey is not for me and I'm just not fighting for myself. I'm fighting for, for change and I'm fighting for making a difference. And, um, and, you know, it's an entertainment business and MMA and everything is pretty cutthroat, but I, I still believe that change can be made. And, um, and I'm really blessed. And I, I, I just want to thank, you know, Ariel for make, doing all that research and, you know, bringing all these things and, um, and all those people had really believe in me. And, um, and again, it's like for any, any of those who, who have hate in their heart and, and, and feel that, um, it needs to be said and needs to be told in different, in different uh, aspects. I'm just gonna send them blessings and 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 like I want them to know that I don't have any hate in my heart and and I'm really really thankful to be where I am right now. Mm. Uh, just a couple more things and I'll let you go. I know you have a very busy day. Uh, could you describe what the locker room is like right now in AEW? You hear that you know Cody leaves, uh, the MJF thing is brewing, work shoot. Who the hell knows? What is it like? What is the vibe there? If I walk backstage right now, what what is the vibe? How would you describe it? Everybody's working on their thing, man, and and it's like. Um, things are happening and like um, uh, new people are coming and, and people are working on their stuff. You know, I, I can only, I can only speak on myself. Um, I'm going out there with a very positive attitude today and, um, and we're going to kill it. You know, like the most important part is like giving good numbers and, and giving a good show. Yeah. You guys are on a roll. Uh, can I play one uh, word association or name association game with you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. When I say Britt Baker, what do you think? Lights out match. Respect? Dust, Dustin Rhodes. No, when, when, did you have respect for her and does she have respect for you? I have respect for my opponents. Every single opponent I've been in there. Does she have the same for you? I mean, every time we've been in the ring, we've been fine. Okay. We had great matches, you know? Uh, do you, are you happy with the title run? I'm happy when it's happening right now. It's it's like I said, I am in a in a great position to show what you know women like me can do as champions. Can Chris Cyborg compete in wrestling? I know you guys dabbled a little bit. She dabbles on Twitter and whatnot. Can she actually do this? I've said it. Anybody can. If you put your mind into it, you can do whatever you you want. Okay, fair enough. Maybe, and maybe, uh, can you tell Tony, um, he doesn't want to do an interview with me, but I'd love if you could tell him about El Nariz and maybe I can show up on Dynamite. What do you think? Sure. <laughs> okay, maybe you could put in a good word if you see him later today in St. Louis? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, gspawn.com slash Thunderosa is the auction site. Uh, all the proceeds going to the victims and the families of the horrendous shooting in Uvalde. And you are uh, returning to Combate Global on Paramount Plus on Friday, July 15th and Friday, July 22nd as a guest color commentator. And then at some point, Campbell's going to pull you aside and give you a huge offer to fight and you will main event that show and it will be a really, really big deal. I can foresee it now. <laughs> we'll see a lot of that, man. We'll see a lot of that. <laughs> Uh, much respect to you, Melissa Thunderosa. Big fan of what you do and what you represent and how you conduct yourself and uh, that you fight for the, you know, for the for, for the forgotten, so to speak, for the people that don't get the shine. So keep it up and don't let those haters get you down, all right? You have a home here. We got your back. Ariel, do, do you see me crying? Do no, you see no. me sad? Do you I'm see just me saying. angry? No, no, it's like, that's what I'm saying is that um, at the end of the day, tomorrow is going to be a better day. Uh, people are going to say things. People are going to, you know, create, you know, controversy and everything. At the end of the day, man, I'm here to to be kind, to be nice, and to make a difference, right? And like I said, like my friend sent me a, a, a Bible verse, and, and it's just, again, it's like, I am, I am happy where I am, and I'm able to provide something that I never ever in my life I would be able to if I wasn't here in this moment. And I'm going to enjoy every single moment, good or bad, because the good teaches you good stuff that you know that you're going to learn for the future. And, and you know, um, I'm just like, again, I'm, it, it's, it's rough sometimes, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I'm here talking to you, Ariel, and I'm about to do some freaking amazing stuff. That other people are not able to. So I am happy about that. I am focusing on the positive. Now continue to focus on the positive. Respect. And good luck to your son as well. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Talk to you later. There she is, the great Thunder Rosa, the AEW Women's World Champion, doing a great thing uh, for a lot of families over in uh, in Texas, Uvalde, Texas, to be exact. Gspawn.com slash Thunder Rosa is the website where you can uh, place a bid on her gear that she wore at Double or Nothing. She is the champ. And again, returning to Combate Global on Paramount Plus Friday, July 15th and Friday, July 22nd. A lot of MMA to come uh, in July. A lot going on. There's uh, obviously all the UFC events, obviously all the Bellator events, Combate doing events, PFL doing events. There's just a lot going on, my friends. A lot going on. That was a lot of fun. You guys didn't expect me to break out the... uh... No, we didn't. Yeah, you didn't expect that, huh? You didn't show that in rehearsal. Sometimes I like to keep a few things in my back pocket. You didn't know about El Nariz. I think this was El Nariz's first appearance on the program. On this program, yeah. You surprised? Uh, pleasantly. pleasantly. Were you surprised, surprised at how cool I looked? So cool. Yeah. I need to get one for myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. El Nariz is a big deal over there. Um, I mean, I show up to the events, AAA events, and they're like, oh my God, El Nariz is here. Wow. It's amazing. I'm so excited to talk to our next guest. He is the brand spanking new... UFC light heavyweight champion. What a scene it was on Monday. They held a parade in his honor. 7,000 people in the Czech Republic there to honor him, to celebrate him. Very few fighters. Even Conor McGregor himself joked that someone at the uh, the baggage claim just said, hey, how are you? And congratulations when he beat Jose Aldo. Very few fighters can draw a crowd like that in their hometown, in their home country after winning a big UFC fight. But Yuri Prochaska deserves it. He has uh, worked his way to this spot. He has, again, done it the uh, the hard way as well. And he is now the undisputed UFC light heavyweight champion. He is kind enough to join us a few days removed from that big victory. Here he is. The champ is here. How are you, Yuri? Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Hi, I'm great. Everything's great. I can't, Thank you. I can't imagine. Uh, it, it must be an incredible time in your life. You must be on cloud nine. Very nice to see the the belt right behind you over there. And you look great as always. Uh, could I ask you, Yuri, you, <laughs> you do look great. How are you feeling by the way? I, I mean, obviously you had the cut, the, the, how are you feeling physically? Oh, no, everything, everything's good. Just, just a little cut and, but everything's good. I feel great, but a little bit disappointed by my performance from the fight and, uh, but next time I will be better. It will be better. Okay, I want to ask you about that in a moment. Just uh, curious, how many stitches up there? Oh, uh, I think more than twelve. Uh, twelve, yeah, I think twelve. But some uh, the skin, the twelve. But the muscle, some on the muscle. I think five, six on the muscle. Wow. Okay. Um, all right. So l- let us get into the the fight. Why are you disappointed? Uh, yeah. I'm disappointed by it because I I didn't show what what I what I said before the fight like a total dominance and um, I I did I didn't felt felt like uh, uh, like I won I was wanted to to feel okay. In the fight. Uh, was was that something that you were feeling leading up to the fight like the week of the fight were you not feeling you know, a hundred percent this or that, or was it just something yeah, in the fight yeah. itself? Yeah. Yeah. You, that feeling. Yeah. Uh, a little bit, uh, how to say, a little bit change my, change my, change my, uh, attitude in, before, before the fight. And that was not good idea. And, uh, I know what to do for the next time. And, and yeah, but belt is here. I'm glad for that. That's that's good enough. Could I ask? Because I'm I'm very uh, curious and interested in your mindset. You have a very you know obviously you you believe strongly in the samurai spirit and the bushido spirit. What was the attitude that changed that you're kind of unhappy about? Uh, that's my that's my personal that's okay. my personal stuff. And but it's not about the fighting. It's it's my personal life. When I have to change a little bit, and for the next time it will be better. Okay. 
Uh, what about just curious, you know, your last fight prior to this one was in May of last year, but it wasn't that you were injured or anything. It just, you know, the timing didn't work out and you had to wait for Glover to come back. Uh, did you feel yeah. a little bit rusty out there because it had been over a year since your last fight? Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, uh, but it was a good time to, to, to upgrade my, my style to, uh, to evolve in the wrestling and in the jiu-jitsu, in the jiu-jitsu. And I think that's the one thing what I, what I'm a little bit proud for myself. I showed I'm not, uh, not, uh, not so bad in the wrestling and in the jiu-jitsu. So, so I, so I think it's, uh, that improvement is, it's, it's good. And yeah. it's good. And, and before the fight, obviously, we saw you a little bit in Arizona training with Henry Cejudo yeah. and Captain Eric. Yeah. Was that your decision? Like, did they reach out to you or did you reach out to them? How did that happen? No, they, they, they offered me to train there. To help. They have the keys how to, how to help me uh, improve my wrestling, especially the wrestling. We are in a fight with, uh, with the Clover. And uh, I'm glad for, for that time in Arizona because uh, I think I, I found a way how to include the wrestling in my style. And now I'm, I will keep going uh, in that. But all the time I have to keep uh, attention, pay, pay, paying the attention of, uh, for, for my stand-up because I love the game in stand-up. And for the next time, I have to be, I have to do some, some steps to, to, to improve that. Will you go back to Arizona for your next fight, next training camp? Well, uh, we will see. We will see. I will. I will talk with them. I will talk with them, and maybe yeah. Okay. Um, was Glover tougher than you expected him to be, or was he just as tough? Uh, Glover was tough, and I expect he will he will be, he will be like that in the fight. But I didn't. I I forgot to to keep myself in the attitude what I want to be in the fight, and that was the main mistake. That's why. That's why I. Uh, that's why it was the performance for myself like it was. Um, when he cut you open, was there any concern on your part that they might try to stop the fight? Uh, yeah, uh, I started to play the game with him. Like uh, I started to smile on him uh, when he was on the mount. Yeah, <laughs> and he grounded, and he grounded pound me. And after he opened me, I said, no, man, that's for that. I love him. <laughs> that's for that. And I prayed in that moment. I prayed for that. Uh, the referees don't, didn't stop the, the, the fight for, for, for that cut. Yeah. Did, did the blood bother you? Uh, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and and you you were kind of playing with fire a little bit a couple of times because you were tapping him saying like good job. But initially when I'm yeah. watching it, I'm like, wait a second, did he just tap? Obviously it's clear you didn't. But why did you do that? Why did you feel the need to do that? I like I, I did that because I tried to to push him like to push him to give me more, give me more, show me more. Yeah, like uh, because I I tried to to make make him. Uh, some action yeah and if and i wait for that action to 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 do some uh, to reverse it yeah and that's why i did i did that not for for tapping just that of course just, uh, yeah for like like a strategy but but it was so very dangerous yeah I, and now i i realized i realized that uh will you will you not do that again just in case <laughs> Maybe, maybe, but uh, 
in uh, not in in the same like like the same uh, like with the same moves. Yes. <laughs> not with not with tap. No with tapping. <laughs> was was there anything that he did that surprised you? Uh, he was he was tough. He was a tough fighter. Like uh, his mindset and his automatism in the fight was amazing. I think one of the toughest fi uh, fighter what I ever what I ever met. Really? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. There was I, I met a lot of guys who was so strong. Glover wasn't so strong. He wasn't so uh, sp speed like uh, quick. And he wasn't so fast, sorry, he wasn't so fast. And but his mindset to going, to going, still going through through all these uh, obstacles and all these things, still keep going. That was uh, that was uh, from him very uh, smart and uh, and that was something what make him dangerous. Mm. Uh, do you recall going into the fifth round? What did you think the score was? Three one, yeah, two two. I, I, I what did you think you were at? I, yeah, I knew. I knew that. I knew that uh, uh, it's like uh, fifty fifty, mm. and I I I I realized that uh, I have to do something more to end him. But my my uh, left hand was a little broken, and. Uh, I, uh, I I did I, I I forgot how how to how to end him in the stand up that there was no no way because he was so tough and every time when I uh, when I uh, tried to 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 short the dis short the distance he tried to wrestle me to the uh, to the ground so uh, in for the last round before the last round. I just said, what's, uh, what gave me he like some opportunity to end him? I will use it. Huh. We, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter which one. And in the end, there was a rear naked choke. And so I used that. It was amazing because like with a minute left in the fight, he was in mount. Yeah. And if you're watching it, you're yeah. like, man, you know, all he has to do is survive this last minute and he may win this fight. Do you remember, if anything, what were you thinking in that moment? What were you thinking? As you're about to reverse him, you had your feet up on the cage and then you, you did a beautiful reversal. Are you thinking, I have to move here because the clock is ticking on my, my dream yeah, to become yeah. a champion? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. That, that was a little bit hard moment and, and I tried to, to just keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, and something will come. Something will come. I, I believed in that. Wow. I believed in that, and then, then, then it come came. It felt to me from afar that when you reversed him, it almost broke him as well. Could you tell that you had an opening here to do something to finish him when when you were able to get him off of you, and now you were in the dominant position? It felt like almost it was. Uh, deflating for him you know what i'm saying yeah did you did you feel that as well yeah yeah i felt that and i i tried to 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 do that like like that to to be in the dominant position and uh, but yeah that last seconds that was uh i think i i gave in that uh, every everything yeah. It's incredible. 28 was, seconds, you submitted him. He's never been submitted yeah, in his yeah. incredible career. Never once. Uh, you're the first man to yeah. do it. Were you surprised when he tapped in that moment? Uh, I was not, not surprised, but I want to be sure in that. So that's why I, 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 keep that, I kept that, uh, that choke and he tapped and I, I didn't believe that, so I had to see. I had I had to see that, and so I watched that. Yeah, it, it's real. Okay, okay, let's 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 do that. Wow, can you even put into words describe? And and I appreciate you doing the interview in English. I know English isn't your first language, but you're improving a lot. Can you even describe what that moment felt like for you when you finally realized your dream of being UFC champion? 
It's a part of the way. For me, it's a part of the way. Uh, it's a part of the way to to win every fight. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a part of the way. Like, uh, it's the confirming that the way what I what I choose is right. Hmm. Yeah. Amazing it, okay, that everything you have done, right? Everything you've done to transform your life, that it was all it was all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, sometimes, sometimes uh, I I I do mistakes. Yeah, but there is still it's it's still about the learning how, what what to do and what to do not. So, just curious. Uh, after that, you know, it's like the morning time over there, maybe early mo late morning, early afternoon. How did you celebrate? Because I know you had to fly home several hours later. Did you do anything to celebrate in Singapore? Uh, I no, I celebrate with with the guys who uh, who who was who, who were there uh, to support me. Uh, in the after party, I I I I took the beer one, just one beer, two cigarettes, two little two little calm down to enjoy the moment. But still, I I I didn't didn't believe I didn't believe that. Wow, cigarettes! You smoke cigarettes, Yuri? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes in the in the, wow. when I have when I, when I need to keep myself down and to realize the moment. Sometimes I'm, I I smoke the cigarettes. And then you come home. How do you how do you pronounce the the town that you're from? Is it Birno? It's a Brno, yeah. Brno. 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 Uh, you come home and then they do this parade for you. Seven thousand more than seven thousand people there. Did honestly, did you expect when they said they're going to do this for you? Did you expect that many people to show up? Did you expect it to look like that? Uh, I did. I, no, I didn't. Didn't expect that. But uh, in the Czech Republic, it was. Uh, I think it was a big thing. It was a big thing because because it's the uh, highest highest league of the of the MMA fighters. Yeah, and and I I, I won that. Yeah, I know it was like 50-50, but I won that fight. And I think uh, the people here, I think they, they can be proud for that. The small, that, that, like the small Czech Republic have now the champion of the biggest, uh, uh, biggest UFC. Incredible. Leading up to the fight, could you tell that there was that much interest in your story? Like, were you getting a lot of yeah. attention? It was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. And so when you got there, like, can you even describe what you're there? All your people are there to celebrate you, just you. Like, you are, you're the guy. It's not a team. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to share the energy, the victory energy with, with them because, uh, the guy, the, the people from 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 Czech Republic who who watching the uh, the MMA and they understand the MMA, they are really like energetic people, yeah. And uh, they 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 were so uh, so so loud and yeah, it was amazing. It was emotional, and I'm glad to to represent. Czech Republic in the UFC. Incredible. Uh, and now when you walk outside, like, can you even go outside without people recognizing you? Or is it just constant? You're going outside and people are stopping you. No, <laughs> not, no, no, not so much now <laughs> because now, now is now that this week yeah, there, there's everybody who will recognize me. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And you are recognizable. The beard, the, the face, the hair, by the way, I noticed the hair, Correct me if I'm wrong. Like the last time you fought, it was very stiff. Like the the ponytail was stiff, but this time it was a little bit more like this. Is there a difference in the way you did the ponytail in the fight? I don't know. Uh, this time, I I leave just uh, just my hair. Yeah. There is no 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 something no something more. It's a just just my hair. So that's why it's uh, smaller. But but it's a just my hair, and I'm proud. I'm. Uh, I'm glad for that. Any particular reason why why the change this time? 
Why? Uh, because from from the start, I wanted to 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 have it like like that. Ah, just from just just from my hair, but uh, but I had I have to uh, to take an attention from the people <laughs> to this. <laughs> I got it. I got it. Um, and so now like life, when you dreamed of becoming a champion, is it, are you living that dream right now? In other words, is this what you expected when you were thinking about life as champion? I know it's just been a few days or is this all still like kind of surreal for you? You still can't believe that this is all happening. It's like a dream that you haven't woken up from. Uh, it's like, uh, it's something like, uh, the nice and beauty, most beautiful dream. And I think I have to be still on the ground because it's not about the belt. It's not about the, uh, all these beautiful things. It's about the work. It's about the work. It's about the, my performance. And it's about, yeah, my performance and my performance was not how I how I uh, how I wanted to to sh what I want to sh what I wanted to show. So that's that's why I'm a little bit disappointed. And uh, yeah, every, everybody 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 saying saying that it's a beauty uh, that was amazing amazing war. Yeah, I la I know it's a good to to show the war. Uh, to the world, but it's not the mastery of the warrior, yeah. And yeah, I think the people have to uh, have to educate more about the fighting to understand this is not the the mastery of the martial arts because this is a, just a tough war, and you have to show more to be like, uh, to be smarter in the, in a fight. Not, not like that. Um, now the big question, it's very interesting, uh, at least to mm -hmm. me to see what they're going to do for your first title defense. And I know it's fresh, but we always want to know what's next. And I feel like there are three options. They can do rematch with Glover, mm -hmm. which he has asked yeah. for, uh, obviously you versus Jan and Eastern Europe would be a huge, huge fight. Cause he's from Poland or the winner of the Anthony Smith Magomed Ankalaya fight. Do you have a preference? If the UFC came to you and said, Yuri, what do you want to do for your first title defense? Who and where do you have a preference? Uh, I don't know what's the, I don't, first, I don't know what's the preference of the UFC, the organization. I want to communicate, uh, I, I want to communicate more with, uh, with the UFC. Uh, what, what they uh, like to, what they want to, from from me, like uh, yeah, that's I want to talk with that. That I want to talk with them about. And and the second thing, uh, I think the most dangerous man here uh, in the light heavyweight di division after me, under me, there is uh, the Jan Blachowicz, and I think he 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 he. Uh, he can be the next, next challenger of me, but still, I have to keep respect for the Glover. So one thing is uh, to offer the Glover rematch, and the second thing is to fight the fight the Jan Blachowicz. I have to uh, I have to make a decision in that, but still, yeah. I will, I have to talk with 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 the UFC and my my managers what will be the best step. Mm. Yeah. Uh you versus Jan in uh Prague or somewhere in Eastern Europe like how big of a deal could that be? Man, that's the that's that's something what I'm thinking about. Yeah. It will that will be I think for for the Europe that will be the most that will be the biggest biggest uh, biggest event ever of the martial arts because me and him, Polish and Czech Republic, they are next next to, 
next to yeah and uh the, i will be ready and I, I will i will i will i will win doesn't matter whatever it takes um could i ask you what did you guys say to each other when you were leaving the cage uh i said to him uh, uh he said congratulations i said to him uh, uh yeah he said congratulations and I am the next, I am the next. I said to him, I was wanted to fight Rakic because, <laughs> yeah, because we, we, uh, we, we spoke, we spoke, you know, we, yeah. we, we spoke together about him. And, uh, and he said, but I won, I am the next one. I said, and I said, okay, let's do that. <laughs> and he started to be so aggressive to, to push it, to push it. And, and I said, be calm. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So were you bothered that he spoke to you in that moment? Like, would you have preferred to just leave it for another time? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe later we, we can, we can, we can talk about, but, but uh, now this time that, that was just uh, after emotional uh, yeah. fights, it was like, do you think you'll fight again this year? I, I want to. I want to to fight uh, till the till the end till the end of this year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and obviously, your preference would be. I mean, they could do it in Prague, right? They've they've had an event in Prague. Would your preference be to be to fight in Czech Republic or somewhere nearby, or would you like to be in America? What would be your preference? My, my preference is to to do that here in Czech Republic. But who knows? Right. Who knows? That will be that that will be the best, the best scenario. Oh my yeah. god, what a scene. Be, you deserve that. That would be incredible. Uh and and I yeah. would love to see it. If they said to you, Glover, it, we're gonna do it for Glover because he's you know up there in age and this could be his last would you you'd be okay with it? Glover again? Who knows? Uh, I have to, like I said, yeah. uh, I have to talk with you and see what will be the best uh, best case. Yeah. And uh, before I let you go, what, what is the BJP Foundation? Could you tell us what that is? Uh, yeah, uh, that's my that's my foundation, which I uh, which I found uh, uh, this uh, maybe the last year. Yeah, la la last year to to. To give back, just just for for the giving back, something giving back, yeah. To because I'm glad for for all these things around me, for the for the people around me, for the team who support me and who help me because I have a good people around me, and I just want to give them back something giving back. Amazing! Yeah. Well, what a life you've had uh, up until this point. What a transformation! I read in an ESPN article. Is it true that you drank vodka out of the the motorcycle? Is that true? Man, who 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 where where, where do you take this uh, this information? <laughs> uh, ESPN, ESPN.com. Mark Ramundi did a story on you, a great story, and uh, everyone <laughs> yeah, read that and was yeah. like, "Wow." Yeah, I know, I know, but but who 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 said that? <laughs> who said that? Is that true it was, though? It's. Uh, so it was on uh, uh, that. That's from uh, from the secret uh, <laughs> secret party <laughs> with, with with my guys, and there in my in my parties, in my secret celebration. There there is a lot of crazy stuff. So so I don't want to talk about it. Okay, <laughs> this time did you when you celebrated? Did, was there any vodka out of the motorcycle or no more? That would be that would be that would be something. Uh, Something better. <laughs> oh, something better? Wow. I can't even imagine what's better than that. Uh, that is crazy, my friend. But uh, you're, you're a different kind of cat, and I think that's why people really appreciate you and enjoy watching you fight. Uh, so I just want to wish you congratulations. Amazing. That scene on Monday was just unbelievable. Everyone's dream as a fighter, I would, I would imagine, would be to have a moment like that, have your country celebrate you like that. We, we have not seen that in MMA. I mean, this is really unique, special stuff. And it's it's really cool to see how much it means to people. Uh, like I said, here in Czech Republic, the the MMA is still growing, but the community who who likes the MMA 
it's very strong. It's very strong, and they they are uh, crazy fans. They are very crazy fans. Yeah, you're more famous in the Czech Republic than Yarmir Jagr, than Dominic Hasek. You walk down oh, the street, more no. people know you and like you. No, the, I think the, J, the JJ Yarmir Jagr is a uh, he's a legend, living legend, right <laughs> right now. So it's a uh, it's a long time to be to be like him. Well, you are on your way, Yuri. Congratulations. Thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Enjoy the belt. Enjoy everything that comes with it. And uh, once again, incredible fight on Saturday. I know you weren't happy with some of the things that you did, but that's one of the greatest light heavyweight title fights that we've ever seen. It was incredible to watch. And uh, really, congratulations on winning the way in which you did with just seconds remaining. Says a lot about you as a fighter. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all the best. Talk to you soon. There he is, the one and only Yuri Prochaska, the reigning, defending UFC light heavyweight champ. Well, I just got a, uh, I just got a text from Glover. I uh, just got a text from Glover saying, "Ask Yuri when we do the rematch." Uh, he sent me that uh, five minutes ago. I think he's traveling right now. I don't know how he saw that, but... Uh... He's always watching. Glover, how about that? Sending me the text mid-interview. This is why you have to... Uh... This is why you have to uh, check your phone in the middle. How great is Yuri Prochaska? I mean, man, what a shirt, huh? What a beard. What a hairstyle. UFC has to be very excited about the prospects of him being champion right now. Unique character comes from a place where, uh, as he said, MMA is very popular, but still somewhat in its infancy as far as one of the popular sports, but you saw that crowd. How amazing was that? The guys won what now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thirteen in a row. Three and in the UFC. All finishes. KO'd Volcanoes. By the way, in that 13 fight winning streak, one of them via decision. That's it. Just one. Glover. Sub, Dominic Reyes, KO, spinning back elbow, one of the best uh, knockouts of 2021. And then Volkan Ozdemir in July of 2020 got the performance of the night, KO'd him as well. Won the Rise in Light Heavyweight Championship, uh, successfully defended it against CB Dalloway, beat Fabio Maldonado, beat King Mo, beat Brandon Halsey, beat Jake Hune, beat Fujita. Last time he lost the fight was December of 2015 in the Ryzen World Grand Prix. And uh, now he's the man at 205. Interesting time. So it sounds to me, if I were to read between the lines, it sounded to me like Jan would be his top choice. That's the way I perceived it. And Jan versus Yuri in Eastern Europe, and in particular in Prague, and I understand they're six hours ahead, and I understand the UFC doesn't like to do pay-per-views over there, but sometimes, man, it's like, yo, you have a scene like that, you have a champion like that, you have a fan base like that. If this was boxing, I can guarantee you his next fight is happening either in the Czech Republic or somewhere nearby because it only, like, you see that scene at the parade, he only comes across as a bigger star as a result. He comes across as a much bigger star. You see how people react, like, wow, this guy's a big deal. I need to start following him. I need to start paying attention to him. He is now viewed in a different light. So you put him back in that setting in a title defense. The whole week is about him and he's being celebrated. It's a massive deal and it's in a stadium or a big arena, blah, blah, blah. As opposed to what will likely happen, is, you know, well, let's put him in Dallas or let's put him in Phoenix or better yet, let's put him in Utah. And by the way, to everyone out there in Utah, I wasn't ragging on Utah Utah's a fine place. I'm a, I'm a sort of friend of the program, of the Utah Jazz. They love me. Hashtag take note. I wasn't ragging on Utah, but Utah has no connection 
to Leon Edwards or Kamar Usman. I'm not sure if you know this, uh, the Nigerian nightmare and or Birmingham's Leon Edwards have no connection to Utah whatsoever uh, and Salt Lake City whatsoever. So I wasn't ragging on Utah. It was just like, this is a very random, to me, combat sports are at its best when the location has something to do with the fight. And this is just a random one. Now, I understand the owners of the Jazz, they wanted them to come, and I think they owed them an event from the pre-pandemic days and all that stuff. And they, you know, look, this speaks to the power of the brand, power of the UFC. They could go to an, uh, a venue, they could go to the O2 and just say, hey, UFC's coming to town and most likely you're going to sell it out. And then they'll add, you know, Aspinall and Patty and Mohammed Mohaev and Molly and all these people. Uh, that's the that's what every promoter wants. Top Rank can't do that. Matchroom can't do that. Um, Bellator can't. No one can do that other than the UFC and combat sports. That's the WWE model. That's what they want. Still, it's nice when you get... Why do we talk about Connor versus Brandau? Why do we talk about GSP versus Shields? Um, why do we talk about these big moments when, you know, the local... Steep A in Cleveland. I could go on and on. It's because it just makes it seem that much more special. So I hope that they do it. I don't think they will do it. Probably be somewhere else, but it would be pretty damn cool. Now, that was uh, one of the big winners. Unfortunately, uh, the night didn't go Tyler Santos's way, but I would strongly argue, and I think the rankings would reflect that, that even though she didn't beat Valentina Shevchenko, uh, she came out looking and feeling and just being perceived as a winner because a lot of people didn't expect her to give Valentina, the fight that she gave Valentina. And a lot of people upon initial viewing thought that she won the fight. And so without further ado, I wanted to get the Tyler Santos story out there as well. And she is kind enough to be joining us from Brazil. Uh, Tyler, thank you so much for the time. Obrigado. I appreciate it. And we're also being joined by your manager slash translator, the great Tiago Akamura as well. So thank you, Tiago. Thank you to both of you. Thanks, guys. É, até agradecendo a tua presença aí, né, e tá vindo contar um pouco da história do que aconteceu. Cool. Oi. Oi, tá, tá me ouvindo? Sim. É, ele tá só agradecendo você estar tá vindo aí no programa e, e participar e contar um pouco da história aí do que foi acontecendo. Tá, é, ok, eu que agradeço, né, é, pelo convite, estou muito feliz. E, então, estamos aí para falar um pouquinho né, dessa luta que foi super importante aí na minha carreira. Estou muito feliz. Sim, estou muito feliz com a oportunidade de estar falando com você. E, você sabe, foi um grande fight, muito importante na minha carreira. E eu sei que há algumas coisas que precisam falar sobre isso. Sim, e eu agradeço o tempo. Eu gostaria de perguntar, primeiro e foremost, Tyler, como está o seu olho feeling? Primeiramente, antes de qualquer coisa, perguntar como é que está o seu olho, né? como é que você está se sentindo. É, meu olho tá bem, é, já desinchou bastante, quase nem tô sentindo dor, é, tomando todo o medicamento, né, que foi indicado, e tá bem tranquilo, é, tá tendo uma melhora bem rápida, na verdade, e só esperar baixar um pouquinho mais o inchaço, né, para poder estar tá efetuando a cirurgia, mas tá tudo ok. So the eye is doing all right, like compared to where it was uh, on fight night, uh, I'm taking a lot of medication that the, the doctor prescribed and Now we're just waiting for the swelling to go down. It has gone significantly down, but we got to wait for it to come down so we can get into surgery. Uh, do you know when you'll have the surgery? Você tem ideia de quando, mais ou menos, você vai estar fazendo a cirurgia? Olha, eu acho que daqui umas duas semanas, por aí, já vai estar, já vou estar efetuando a cirurgia. Yeah, what we were told by the doctor was that we needed about two weeks for the swelling to come down and then we'd be able to do the procedure. Okay, and of course that's for the uh, the broken orbital. And and did they tell you how long the recovery will be? É, então essa pelo pelo orbital quebrado, né? Teve eles deram uma perspectiva de quanto tempo vai demorar para recuperar? Olha, eu acho que a recuperação é uma recuperação bem rápida. Eu acho que é coisa de um mês, um mês e pouquinho, é, tomando todo o cuidado necessário, né? O mais importante é só evitar a pancada ali em cima, né? Evitar porrada, que isso não vai acontecer. Yeah, main thing is just to be careful not to, to get uh, hit on the on the region, but what the doctor told us was about a week for the actual cut and the, the procedure to, to heal up. 
and then about a month and a half or two, two for the bone to restructure itself around the, the mesh that they're going to put it in. Okay. Um, now I, I wanted to go back to the, the kind of beginning of this particular story. Um, you get the fight. It's a big deal. You're fighting the pound for pound number one. And obviously you're an underdog. Everyone's an underdog who fights Valentina. Leading up to the fight, fight week in Singapore, was your confidence growing? How would you describe how you were feeling as you were heading into the biggest fight of your life? É a maior luta da sua vida, né? Você estava indo contra uma uma das atletas melhor, pound for, pound for pound do, do feminino, e um atleta que praticamente todo mundo que pisou na frente dela ali foi era zebra, e você era uma zebra nesse caso também. É, como é que foi essa semana de luta para você? Como é que estava a sua confiança na, na semana e, e chegando na luta? É, eu estava bem confiante, né? É, porque foi isso que eu almejei durante toda toda essa minha vida, esse meu decorrer de treino, né, essa minha carreira. É, então, eu estava muito feliz, até porque eu consegui isso em muito pouco tempo, né, dentro de duas lutas ali eu consegui é, a chance ao título. Então, eu consegui mostrar o que eu queria mostrar realmente, que ela tinha falhas, então eu consegui mostrar isso, ela falou que não iria vencer em nenhuma das áreas nela. E foi muito fácil eu conseguir pôs nela o meu jogo de chão, consegui fazer minhas quedas, então eu consegui mostrar e desvendar que sim, ela tem falhas e que ela não é um monstro na categoria. Yeah, so I was very confident, you know, that's what I worked my entire life towards and within two big fights in the UFC, I was able to get my title shot um, and I was able to show the world that, you know, she is human, you know, she's not a monster, you know, she does have weaknesses that we were able to map out and work on. And that's the thing she said on the interview that she wouldn't, she couldn't see me beating her in any area. And I was able to show that, you know, there are quite a few things that you can do against her that are going to get you to success. Did you feel leading up to the fight like she was looking past you, like she didn't, you know, respect the threat that you brought to the table? Olhando assim, a, a chegada da luta, você acha que ela meio que é, ignorou o risco que você podia trazer para ela? É, com certeza, ela estava super confiante e acreditando que eu seria só mais uma, né? É, até que ela falou nas entrevistas, né? Se perguntaram se aonde ela achava que eu iria dar risco para ela, e ela falou em lugar nenhum. Então, ela estava achando que eu seria apenas mais uma, né? Mas ela estava enganada, porque eu entrei lá para mostrar, né? Que realmente eu sabia os pontos fracos dela e que eu era muito mais capaz do que ela, em mostrar que né, ela não era aquele monstro que todas as meninas ou que todo mundo fala. So, for sure. You know, uh, even like the, the comments that she had prior to the fight, we know that, you know, it's a lot about showing confidence, but, you know, she said that I wouldn't really bring her uh, danger in many areas, and, you know, so that clearly showed how she was uh, perceiving me. But that's the thing. I uh, went in there, you know, I did my thing, and we had her mapped out completely, and we were able to, to find a lot of success there, even though she, you know, she didn't expect anything out of me. To, she expected me just to be another one, but I was able to show otherwise. Of the first three rounds, which do you think you won? Rounds one, two, three. Do you think you won one and three, two and three, one, two and three? Now that you look back at it, which of the first three rounds do you think you won? É, revendo a luta, né? Dos primeiros três rounds, quais que você acha que você ganhou? Eu vi a luta só é, depois do evento, né? Eu cheguei no hotel, eu vi a luta, tava passando. Então, mas eu não não vi assim para fazer aquela análise. Eu só assisti ali de sangue quente. Então, na verdade, eu ainda preciso parar para analisar, assistir, né? Com calma e analisar. Mas o que eu acho que os três primeiros ali eu venci. E também eu até consegui quedar ela no quarto round também, consegui manter um tempo ali o domínio. E, mas depois eu também, no quarto round, eu já estava com o olho afetado, mesmo assim eu consegui levar ela para o chão, consegui ter um tempo de domínio ali. Mas não dá para citar também como os árbitros ali viram, né? Que teve uns que até deram o primeiro round para ela, então não tenho como citar o, qual foi a visão deles, né? You know, uh, I only really rewatched it uh, after I came back from the hospital. You know, it was airing there at the, the hotel, and 
I watched it, you know, I was still, the blood was still boiling a little bit, but I believe that I won the, the first three rounds upon that first watch. But let's be honest, I didn't really watch it scoring. So, right. you know, there might be some bias to my, <laughs> my judgment, but I think I did enough on the first three rounds to win it. But, and on the fourth round, I did get a takedown. I got a little bit of control there. But, you know, considering one of the judges didn't even give me first round, you know, who, <laughs> how, how can we even understand what's going on in their minds? So, it's right. Not, uh, what, if anything, surprised you about the first three rounds? Like, obviously, you were confident going into it, but were you surprised that you were able to take her down like you were able to, able to control her like you were able to? You got her back at one point, uh, the neck crank, you were going for the rear naked choke. Any of those things surprising to you, or are these all things that you expected truly to happen in the fight? Eu tive uma surpresa que você teve nesses primeiros três rounds, né? Você conseguiu muito sucesso, conseguiu quedar, conseguiu pegar cotas, conseguiu botar um crossface nela. É, teve alguma coisa que te surpreendeu nesses três primeiros rounds? É, do, da parte dela, assim, que você perguntando? Ah, no geral, acho que de como você desenrolou a luta. Ah, é, eu, na verdade, consegui fazer tudo que eu treinei, que eu queria fazer, né? Então, eu fiquei bem surpresa até por conta de que o pessoal botava muita pressão, né? Tipo, ah, é Valentina, Valentina. Então, quando eu entrei ali e consegui já impor as minhas quedas, consegui dominar, consegui né, até o quarto round com as costas dela muito facilmente, então isso me surpreendeu. Eu pensei, nossa, eu até pensei que seria mais difícil, né? Eu sempre acreditei que ela não era um monstro, que ela tinha falhas, mas eu achei muito tranquilo, assim, eu achei que ia ser, né, que eu ia ter um pouco de dificuldade para conseguir até impor as minhas quedas, ou ter um domínio ali sobre ela, né, mas ali me surpreendeu, porque eu consegui fazer tudo bem facilmente. Honestly, uh, I was a little bit surprised of uh, how well the, the game plan worked and, and how well everything that I've trained for worked, you know, because, you know, we're going there and everybody's like, oh, it's Valentina, it's Valentina, it's the, the, the boogie woman of the division. But, you know, everything worked out pretty much as it was planned. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting it to be as smooth as it really was. Wow. Did you think at any point that you were on the verge of finishing her in those first three rounds? Like, did you think she was going to tap? Um, did, like, was there ever a thought in your mind that you were like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm about to become champion, I'm about to beat Valentina? Três primeiros rounds, teve algum momento que você sentiu, falou, pô, agora eu vou pegar, eu acho que eu vou, eu vou virar campeã aqui. Sim, teve um momento ali no primeiro round mesmo, é, quando eu fui para as costas ali, né, consegui pegar o mata-leão, nossa, naquela hora eu senti o gosto, assim, da vitória e tal, mas faltou os detalhes ali, né, faltou dar uma mão com mão, faltou um pouco de calma, porque o momento, a ansiedade ali, né, acabou dando uma atrapalhada, mas aquele momento ali eu senti, assim, senti o gostinho da vitória. Yeah, for sure. On the first round, especially, uh, I had her back and I went for the rear naked choke. I could taste the victory there. But, you know, there were some details that I should have adjusted. Maybe if I changed my grip a little bit, went hand to hand, instead of trying to put the pressure on my arm, maybe I could have gotten it. But, uh, you know, things that we learned. But when you clashed heads in the fourth round, could you feel right away that something bad had happened? Or did it take some time because of the adrenaline? Ali, quando vocês bateram a cabeça no, no terceiro round, você entendeu na hora o que tinha acontecido? Ou precisou a adrenalina abaixar um pouquinho para você conseguir entender? É, na hora que houve o impacto ali, eu não sabia o que, que tinha acontecido. Eu só senti que meu olho super inchou, eu estava sentindo muita dor, mas eu não tinha se ligado que tinha sido uma cabeçada. É, eu não olhei nem para o telão, nada. Eu só sei que quando eu voltei para o quarto round, assim, eu não estava vendo nada. Mas eu não tinha noção do que tinha acontecido, só fui ver depois. Honestly, when the clash hit, I, all I knew was that I was in a lot of pain and my eyes started to swell a lot. Mm. You know, I couldn't really point out what happened. Um, I didn't look at the screen, I was more concerned about, you know, what was happening in my face and, and trying to understand it. Uh, so that's the thing, like right away, I, I had no idea what exactly happened, just that it was something bad. From that point forward, could you see out of your right eye at all for the remainder of the fight? A partir daquele momento, você estava conseguindo enxergar do seu olho esquerdo? Como é que estava? Não, eu não estava consegui... conseguindo enxergar nada. Eu, eu voltei para o quarto round e eu até comecei a ter uma conversa interna ali comigo mesmo. Eu pensei, nossa, o que, que eu vou fazer agora? O que está que acontecendo? Tipo, eu não estava vendo nada. Daí eu pensei... Eu tentei fechar o olho para ver se eu conseguia ter uma visão melhor, 
mas estava horrível, o olho fechado, né, ela daí ela ia ver que eu fechei o olho ali, ela estava tentando bater só em cima daquele lado machucado, e com o olho aberto eu não estava enxergando nada. Então, estava bem difícil, porque ela já é canhota. Então, eu estava, tipo, muito perdida. Não, não sabia, não tinha noção de como acertar ela, porque eu estava toda perdida. E... Então, atrapalhou muito ali, porque fiquei sem visão mesmo do lado direito. Yeah, for sure. Like, once the eye closed, I really couldn't see anything. Uh, I started seeing a lot double, and then I started having an inner dialogue, like, okay, what can I do here? So if I close my eyes, I'm going to be able to see a little bit better. I'm not going to have the distance, mm. but I can see a little bit better. But then she's going to know that something is bad, something's really wrong. And that's what happened, you know, with the eye closed, I could see a little bit better because at least I wasn't seeing double as much as I lost that, that perception. But then Valentina being left-handed and everything, you know, she just started aiming for it and became a whole other problem. When the fight ended and they were about to announce the scorecards, did you feel in your heart that you had done enough? Obviously, the last two rounds didn't go your way and, and you're hurting, you can't see. But because of the first three, how you felt about them, did you feel like you were about to win 48-47, you were about to become the new champion? Ali quando acabou a luta, né? Tudo bem que você perdeu os dois últimos rounds, mas quando eles estavam se organizando para chamar, você achou que você tinha ganhado, de repente vencido por 48, 47, ou isso nem passou na sua cabeça? Não, passou na minha cabeça, né? Eu pensei, pô, eu tenho a chance, né? É, fui bem ali nos três primeiros rounds, também quedei no, no quarto round, e, mas também eu não fiquei meio assim, porque a gente não tem como saber como os juízes pontuaram, né? E foi o que aconteceu. A gente não, não sabia como eles iam pontuar, deram até rounds ali que eu dominei, deram para ela. Então eu tive, né? Eu estava confiante que podia levar, mas também estava na mão dos juízes, né? Yeah, I, I did believe that I did enough to, to win it, but, you know, uh, as much as I was confident, I, I was aware that you, know, you never know how judges are going to see the fight. You know, so if you don't get a finish, you, you can't really trust that they're going to see the same that you saw that you believe that happened. And that's what happened. You know? uh, were you shocked when you heard that one judge scored it 49-46 for her? Você ficou chocado de saber que teve um juiz que só deu um round para você? Sim, foi um choque ali que a gente pensou, poxa, como o que está acontecendo, né? É, a gente até falou ali que às vezes eles não têm uma visão tão boa quanto os telespectadores, né? Então, mas foi isso, né? A, mão, a luta ficou na mão dos juízes, então não adianta agora chorar pelo leite derramado, mas que a pontuação poderia ter sido diferente. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, we, when I heard it, we thought it was really weird, but uh, there's one thing that, you know, uh, my staff, you know, they, they work a lot on refereeing and judging, and they know that, you know, sometimes a, ref, a judge might not have the best point of view watching the fight. So you never really know what they're seeing because they don't really have a screen in front of them. And people watching the fight from home, they might have a, an actual much better view of what exactly is going on than maybe someone who is judging. So, you know, it's a tough gig and, you know, there are some, some elements there that kind of make a change on, on f how fights are judged that maybe shouldn't be there. Um, and so now here we are four days removed from the fight. Could you tell us, like, even speaking about it now, thinking about it, are you upset? Are you disappointed? Does it make you angry? Do you feel like you were robbed? H how do you perceive the fight a few days removed from what happened? Agora que já passaram alguns dias né, da luta, como é que você se sente em relação ao que aconteceu? Você está chateado? Você sentiu que os caras te roubaram? Como é que você está em relação ao resultado? Estou é, bem feliz, na verdade, porque eu entreguei tudo que eu queria entregar. Eu mostrei que eu mostrei o meu potencial, né? eu mostrei que eu sou capaz, é, e eu mostrei as falhas, eu mostrei o que eu falei dela, eu consegui mostrar. Então, estou muito feliz com o resultado. É, fui lá, entreguei tudo de mim, mostrei que eu sou uma campeã, né? É, não só lá dentro do octógono, mas também na vida. Então, estou muito feliz com o meu resultado e sei que essa não foi a primeira nem a última vez que eu lutei pelo cinturão. Eu sei que eu vou ter a minha chance novamente. Então, estou muito feliz. Yeah, honestly, like I, I can't say that I'm upset. You know, the result wasn't what we were expecting, but I'm happy that you know the performance was what I was expecting. You know, what I did in there was all that I prepared for, and I was able to show uh, everybody was what I told them that I was going to show. 
you know, uh, it's not just about what happens inside the cage. You know, I know that I'm a champion in life. I might not have the, the UFC belt around my waist, but I know that I did enough for it. And in the day, that's the that's not going to be the last time that you guys are going to see me fighting for the belt. That you can be sure. Do you feel like uh, the MMA community and in particular Valentina respects you more now after that performance? Are you feeling that respect and admiration now? Acha que agora, depois dessa luta, o, o cenário do MMA, né, o, os fãs e os atletas te respeitam mais, inclusive a própria Valentina? É, com certeza, né? É, a gente, com certeza, sou muito feliz e tenho certeza que eu ganhei mais respeito com essa luta, né? É, indo lá e mostrando o meu potencial, é, mostrando né, que a gente é capaz. É, com certeza, eu todo respeito, né? Até por ter recebido mensagens da Amanda, do Charles do Bronx, né? Já dá para ver esse respeito que vem sendo reconhecido. Então, é muito bacana. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, you know, after the fight, you know, I think I, I grew a lot in, in the MMA scene. You know, a lot more people probably know me now than they knew before the fight. A lot more people are, you know, actually taking notice of what I do and who I am. And uh, even amongst the fighters, you know, just getting messages from Amanda Nunes and Charles Bronx after the fight, you know, it's just, it's huge for me. Do you want an immediate rematch? Você acha que você o próximo passo seria uma revanche imediata? É, com certeza agora primeiro né eu tenho que cuidar da minha lesão que isso é super importante né em primeiro lugar se não tiver bem eu não posso competir mas com certeza se tivesse uma revanche eu ia aceitar com certeza eu tô preparado eu já mostrei que eu tô preparada né então eu ia ficar muito feliz mas temos que ver aí também o que que o patrão né do White vai decidir o que que ele vai mandar aí. Yeah, that, that's the thing. First, first of all, you know, before anything, I gotta heal up my eye. You know, uh, until I get my eye back in place and get everything in order, I can't really compete. So, you know, first things first. Uh, I believe that I've showed that I'm ready to fight Valentina. You know, better than probably anyone before me in this division. And now it's up for the UFC and Dana. You know, whatever they have in mind. You know, I'm here for it. If it's a rematch, then great. You know, I'm ready for it. Have they just told you? First. Have they told you, though, that they would be willing to give you a rematch once you heal up? Or uh, do they want you to fight, you know, when you come back, fight someone else and then get a, a title shot if you win that? Like, do you have any sort of idea what they're thinking? And Tiago, obviously, uh, you may know as well, so feel free to weigh in as well. Yeah. Ele perguntou se você tem uma ideia, né? Se isso está realmente nos planos do UFC, já fazer essa revanche imediata, né? Qual que é o, o plano deles, se eles já chegaram a, a falar alguma coisa? É, se o UFC falou alguma coisa? É, se eles já falaram alguma coisa em relação à revanche. É, saiu em algumas mídias, né? É, o pessoal pedindo revanche imediata, é, o pessoal a meu favor aí, falando que a cabeçada interferiu e queria muito ver uma revanche e tal, mas nada do UFC mesmo, né? Mais outras mídias pequenas, o pessoal pedindo revanche, falando. Yeah, honestly, like, you know, to her, nothing came from the UFC regarding the rematch, you know, mostly has been like social media and, and you know, media venues just talking about how she deserves it and she does believe that. Uh, I have spoken to Mika after the fight, but, you know, right now it's mostly about just figuring out her return time. We can't really plan anything until we get surgery done and actually understand how really bad it is or how good it is, you know. We're expecting probably at least two months before she can get, can have contact again. Okay. So we really have to understand that first before we work on anything else. Okay. Uh, two last questions uh, from me. Uh, just curious, I spoke to Misha Tate on Monday, and she's fighting at 125, and she said that you pretty much put out the blueprint how to beat Valentina, and she's feeling very confident that if she beats Lauren Murphy and gets a title shot based on what you showed, that she can beat Valentina and maybe even finish her. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that you put out the blueprint and that if someone that is a wrestler that tries to use the blueprint that you put out on Saturday goes in there next against Valentina, they can actually beat her? A Misha Tate conversou com ele essa semana, né? E ela tem a luta com a Lauren Murphy agora. E ela falou que, né, que ela gostou muito da sua performance e que você meio que mostrou um plano que funciona para se ganhar de Valentina. Então, uma wrestler de nível bom, que é o caso dela, se lutasse com ela e seguisse o mesmo plano do seu, a princípio tinha uma chance boa de ganhar dela. Você concorda com isso? Sim, concordo, né? É, eu creio que eu abri portas aí é, para várias lutadoras, mostrei né, que, que não é impossível, 
que é só ter uma boa estratégia ali, conseguir impor né, ela na luta, foi o que eu fiz, eu estava com isso na minha cabeça, eu sabia que aquela era as falhas dela e consegui impor o meu jogo, né, e bem facilmente. Então, se ela manter né, a estratégia dela, entrar focada e tranquila, né, e conseguir levar para o chão ali, eu acho que ela vai ter um sucesso ali nessa área. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I showed what is what regarding uh, Valentina's style and, you know, where we can uh, get some success and someone like Nisha who has a, a very strong wrestling background, you know, she's able to, to get the takedown and get top control. She, she does have a good shot. I, I believe that. Mm. Uh, last question. You fight Valentina again in the future, in the near future. How does it end? Então, se você... A última pergunta dele, né? Você luta com a Valentina de novo, digamos, né? Relativamente logo. Como que essa luta acaba? É, com certeza, se rolar a luta novamente, agora eu tô bem mais tranquila, né? Já perdi todo esse nervosismo de ter o primeiro contato com ela. Então, com certeza, na próxima não vai escapar de uma finalização. Yeah, you know, just getting through the nerves of, you know, fighting for a title for the first time and going through five rounds for the first time, not to mention travel and everything else. I think that confidence on my side is going to be on an all-time high and, you know, probably hers not as high as it was before. And I believe that if we do compete again and I have five rounds, I can get the finish. I can get a submission there. Wow. Uh, what a performance. Congratulations. Parabéns on the performance. I hope you feel better. Tyla, congratulations on what you did out there. And uh, I would love to see that fight again. Thank you so much for the time, both to you and Tiago. I really appreciate it. Obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you for your time and everything else. Thanks, Errol. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. All the best. There she is, Tyla Santos. What a performance on Saturday. Uh, regardless of whether you thought she won or not, And, you know, the more I, I have watched it again and, and I could see, I don't think this was a, it was a really close fight. It was a really close fight. Obviously the two rounds on the back end, four and five go to Valentina. Um, a little bit, I, I mean, again, gun to my head, I still feel the same, but I'm not going to say it's a robbery. Um, I can understand where some people are coming from. I don't think 49, 46 makes sense. Obviously we're talking about a round, um, but it just changes the whole perspective on the fight. I would love to see it again. You, your heart breaks for someone like that where there's such a big discrepancy between being champion and not being champion. And you know how hard you know, the road has been. She's 19 and two, and this is obviously the biggest fight of her career. And she was so close. She had her back. It looked for a second like Valentina was on the verge of having to submit. Um, your heart breaks for someone like that. As great of a champion, as much as we respect and admire, And quite frankly, love Valentina Shevchenko. She's incredible. She's, you know, she doesn't have a, a mean bone in her body. That's the beauty of the sport, right? So I think that now that she has shown some vulnerability, it actually makes her title run even more interesting because you say, oh, if Misha can get in there with her, oh, if Tyla can get in there with her, now, now, you know, no one wants to see just, it's okay to have defense after defense, but you want to see them rise to the occasion or overcome adversity, things of that nature. And now we're going to get that with Valentina. I think it's really interesting. I wish her the best broken orbital. I mean, nothing to scoff at. It's a, it's a tough injury to come back from. And we have seen some fighters have to deal with long-term effects from that. I remember Josh Koscheck would talk about, you know, not feeling the nerves around his mouth. So we hope that isn't the case for Tyla and hope we can see her again very soon. And hopefully she does get to run it back at some point. Like I said, I don't, usually love when the challenger loses and they run it back. Uh, but in this case, certainly wouldn't mind seeing her get another crack at that belt. That would be incredible. Um, all right, so that's the Tyler Santos story. Uh, remember, back into the show, we'll check in with GC wherever he may be from his European travels. And we will also answer your questions. On the nose, we have the questions standing by, but we do have one guest left. And I have to say, very excited to speak to this man. Uh, he has taken the MMA world by storm. He has taken Bellator by storm, especially after his last win over Hornell Lugo, uh, because the promo that he cut afterwards was absolutely amazing. We've played it on the show. We've talked about it. I've talked about him. These are the kind of fighters that Bellator needs, and they have been lacking these personalities. And we had Raytheon Stotts, Recently, a tremendous personality and a part of that 135 tournament. And now we get a man who will be competing on June 24th, very close to here, 
in Connecticut, Mohegan Sun to be exact, Bellator 282 against Leandro Higo. He is quite the character, and I'm very, very excited to speak to Danny, the Italian gangster Savatello for the first time. There he is. Danny, my man, how are you? I'm doing great, bro. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. You're a lot of fun to watch. You're a lot of fun to listen to, uh, to follow. Congratulations on everything you've done up until this point. Do you feel like you're getting loved? Do you feel like you're finally getting some respect in this uh, MMA community? People are starting to notice you more? Yeah, I think finally I'm starting to get a little bit more eyeballs than I've deserved uh, in the past. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't really give a fuck about the attention or anything about that. You know, a lot of these fans in MMA are fucking idiots. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about with fighting. Um, they're always going to talk trash and, you know, I don't put too much stock into it just because successful people don't go on fucking Instagram and, and say all this hate, you know, you don't see Bill Gates or Tim Cook or anyone like that said, given all this hate, but it is nice to obviously get some credit and get the eyeballs on me and, you know, have a little bit of electricity in my fucking fights. But at the end of the day, I don't really give a shit. I'm there to fucking fight there to be exciting there to be myself and there to beat the fuck out of people. I love it. But, but, but yo, you're getting hate from people. I, f I thought you were getting love. I mean, I do get my fair share of love, but obviously there's going to be those fucking idiots on Instagram, on Twitter that are just going to always give hate. Right. You know, people hate successful people. That's just the way it goes. Um, but I kind of thrive off the hate. You know, if it were up to me, I would have more people hate me. I mean, obviously I like being liked and I like having fans and all that, but I think I do better when people are fucking talking shit to me just because that's my territory. Um, so I think I think bring on the shit talk from all these fans. Uh, they're fucking idiots anyways. And yeah, it is what it is. You can either be my fan or don't be my fan. It makes no difference to me. Uh, have you always been this way? Like the, the, the guy that we're talking to now, the guy that we saw after your last one, has, has, has it always been like this? Or are you dialing it up? Are you changing your personality in order to get... We've seen people do this, right? They change their person. Colby did it. We change and now all of a sudden we get attention. Are, are you always this way? Have you always been this way? Yeah, uh, my whole life, you know, I grew up wrestling at the age of four, um, and I kind of always did that. I always believed in mental warfare. I think getting in your opponent's head is is pretty big, and, and it is a thing. You know, some people don't believe in it, but but it is very much so a thing. Um, I'm always going to talk shit to you just because that's what's fun to me. Um, we could be playing pinball. It could be a thumb war. We could be playing darts, and I'm going to talk shit to you. That's just what's fun, and, and I do believe in the mental warfare aspect of it. And you know what? The fact of the matter is this is fighting and this shit's crazy in there. You know, it's not basketball where you miss a bad pass and it's two fucking points. Who gives a shit? Give me a break. It's not football. You miss a block and it's just one extra yard. This is fighting where if your hands are out of place for a fucking centimeter for a split second, say good night, lights out, take care, brush your hair. The results going to the other guy, you lose. So obviously this is very serious business and, and there's a lot of thought that goes into it before each fight. And I think you can get into a guy's head. I know I'm in Higo's head right now. You know, I'm fighting Leandro Higo June 24th at the Mohegan Sun. Um, and I think I'm already in his head. You know, if you look at him, he doesn't really talk trash. I look back at his past fights and he's never really talking shit. But now that he's fighting Danny Sabatello, he feels like he needs to talk shit. And I think June 24th, when he steps into that cage, he's going to feel a little bit more pressure. Those lights are going to be a little bit brighter. His legs are going to feel a little bit heavier. And I think I already got him. I love, so do you feel like there's now a bullseye on you because you talk that shit right now you got to back it up. Yeah, there's a hundred percent of fucking bullseye on me. If you look at me, there's nobody else in Bellator that the entire division is talk about. I, you know, I don't go on Twitter too much just because I'm not into that whole fucking bullshit. The Kardashians, all that stuff. I don't give a fuck about what people are eating for lunch or anything like that. So I don't really get it. But when I do go on there, I see these other bantamweights in Bellator saying my name saying that I fucking suck and all this shit and that I'm fake and all that. So I fucking love it. You know what? If it were up to me, I would fight two at a time. I'd fight Kigo and Stotts June 24th. I'd fight the whole fucking division if it were up to me. But obviously, I got to take it one at a time. Um, and, and they're all mentioning my name. But I, I fucking love it. You, in my opinion, are a gift from the MMA gods to Bellator because they have been lacking. Kind, You know, I know you're not technically homegrown, if you will, but you know, you're, you're, you're not an ex UFC guy or an ex this, or you're coming in, you're fresh, you're young and you're shaking things up a little bit. You've got a person, you've got an edge to you. Do you feel like Bellator is appreciating you? Are they showing you the love? Yeah, they for sure are. You know, Bellator is the shit I'm repping them right now. You know, I'm Bellator till the day I die. You know, obviously I can't do everything. You know, I can't see the future, so I don't know what that holds. 
But if it were up to me, I'd be in Bellator my whole career. I'd retire there. I fucking love their show, their promotion. Everyone that I deal with in Bellator is fucking great. And I think they do see that they got fucking something on their hands with me. Um, and that's just, it's great because it's just who I am. And I'm going to talk shit, whether it's good for business or bad. I'm just fortunate enough that talking shit is good in this business. Um, and, and I am just authentic to myself. And these other guys, they just have boring personalities. You know, what are you going to do? I think if, you know, you're not, you're not talking shit and that's not your style, then don't do it. You know, you got to be true to yourself. But again, I think a lot of these fighters are just boring individuals as it is. And I'm not really boring. You know, I'm always uh, an exciting, passionate, motivated fucking guy. I'm always talking shit no matter what it is. Um, and you never know what you're going to get with me. But again, I do think Bellator sees the star in me. Um, and it's only going to get bigger from here. Kigo. I'm going to beat the shit out of him. I'm going to fucking dominate him. He's not on my skill level. You know, when I go into these fights, I have goals for each one of them. And the goal going into this one is to give Higo between 23 and 29 stitches on his face. I want to scar him for the rest of his fucking life, leave him in a pool of blood. And I'm going to fucking do that. And we only got a week and a half left. And I'm just fucking pumped for it, bro. By the way, why 23 to 29? Is there a specific reason why it's such a specific amount of, of stitches that you're thinking 29 about? is one of my favorite numbers so oh, okay. i just thought that'd be cool you know and that's a lot and at 23 to 29 i just want to give him a lot um obviously you know a couple of butterflies here and there wouldn't do too much damage on him i do want to make this bloody like i made my last fight with jornel lugo um and that's just fighting to me you know i don't necessarily get these first round finishes um where you just kind of can say oh maybe he got caught maybe he slipped up the way I fight and the, what I like to do is just beat the shit out of these guys and then finish them in the later rounds, obviously. Um, and that's what I'm going to do with this one. I see it as a fourth round TKO. I want to fucking torture him first. You know, this is a guy that's disrespectful to MMA. He misses weight all the time like a little bitch. You know, he's just mentally weak. Um, I, I don't know if he's going to make the weight this fight or not. He missed weight his past two fights. Um, but either way, we're going to fight. Um, if he makes the weight, I'm going to beat the shit out of him. If he doesn't make the weight, I'm still going to accept the fight and I'm going to beat the shit out of him. And even if he misses weight by a large margin and the commission doesn't sanction it, I'm going to find him in the parking lot and put his head through a fucking car window. So either way, we're fighting June 24th um, and it's going to be fucking electric. God, this is amazing. You are the man. I love this. Uh, is it personal between you two? Yeah, absolutely. Just because I feel like it's my responsibility to punish this guy. I take missing weight very seriously. You know, you only got a couple of jobs to do in this business. That's make weight and fight. You know, a lot of times these guys are missing weight and it just makes me fucking sick. You know, we don't have a weight cutting problem in MMA. We have a bitch problem in MMA. We got guys that are volunteering to go the weight that they want to. And then when they don't make it, they play the victim card and all that shit. You know, and this guy does it all the time. He's missed weight like four times in his career. So I do feel like it is my responsibility to punish him for that. I want to end his fucking career. And yeah, I, I really just want to fucking punish him. And I'm not going to give him the easy way out. I think we're going to get to a situation and at a point in the fight where he wants his way out because he's dog tired and he can't keep up with my conditioning. And I'm not going to give it to him. I'm going to give him another round of just torturing his fucking face, face and slipping him open. Um, so yeah, I want to torture him, get him tired, get him bloody, and then I'll finish him in the fourth round. You know what's crazy? Uh, you look at your record. Obviously, you had the run in Titan and whatnot. Bro, you won in Contender Series. You had a victory in Contender Series. They were right there. What happened? Why didn't you get the contract? Yeah, I actually have the only 30-24 scorecard in Dana White's Contender Series history. Um, so, you know what? It was a good weekend in my book. People ask me about that and ask me if I'm so fucking pissed. And it's like, no, I fucking showed out. I did what I had to do. Obviously, I didn't get the finish and fans want to see the finish. So, you know, it is what it is. Sometimes you don't get the finish, but you dominate him. And that's what I did to the guy. I fucking dominated him and I just absolutely mauled him. Um, but you know what? It's all worked out because it landed me in Bellator and I couldn't be happier. You know, I got this big opportunity with this Grand Prix situation. So obviously everything worked itself out. I can't be too pissed off. But yeah, I mean, that's another guy on my resume that I just absolutely fucking dominated. And that's what I do in these fights. I, I dominate. I fucking take him down or I stay on the feet. But I fucking punish them, I cut them open, I make it bloody, and I get them fucking tired. No animosity whatsoever. Can you hear me or no? I can't hear you. Touch nothing. All right, here we go. We're back. Uh, no, we're not back. Okay, we're back. Uh, you hear me now? You. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No animosity whatsoever towards the UFC brass? 
I mean, when I first didn't get the contract, I was fucking pissed. You know, I'm calling up Dan Lambert, the owner of ATT, saying, what the fuck's wrong? You know, I called up my manager. I was so fucking pissed. But, you know, I'm at a spot right now that I am in such good hands with Bellator that I can't be pissed off, you know, because the past, the past, I can't just fucking dwell on that. You know, obviously it sucks. If I were to go back, obviously I, I don't want the contract because I'm in great shoes right now. But of course, at the time you want the fucking contract, I'd be an idiot to say, oh yeah, thank God I didn't fucking get it. You know, at that time, that's what I fucking wanted was a contract to the UFC. But obviously it, it played itself out. Um, I'm not too fucking pissed about it. I don't think about it too often. Um, and, and I'm more of so of a guy that just doesn't look too far behind me. And I look, I don't look too far ahead of me. I'm in very exciting times right now. I think right now I'm going to be the face of Bellator. I'm going to be the face of MMA and, and it's only just going to get bigger and brighter from here. So I can't just think about that shit. And plus at the end of the day, dude, I fucking beat the shit out of the guy. I got 30, 24 scorecard. So it was a successful weekend in my book. Can you hear me? All right. Sorry. Yep. Uh, rinky dink operation here. It's my fault. I apologize. Uh, where does the Italian gangster nickname come from? Who gave you that? Yeah. So growing up, I love the Rocky movies uh, and he's the Italian stallion. Um, and, you know, I would beat the shit out of Rocky now. So I didn't really want the Italian stallion. I needed something a little bit more flashy. I wanted to make it my own. Um, and I was in college and it was kind of the time where I needed a nickname because my wrestling career was being done at Purdue. And, and I was sitting around with all my Purdue boys and, and one of them said it, one of them said the Italian gangster. And I just absolutely fucking loved it. I went with it. Of course, now they all claim that they fucking were the ones that come up uh, with it, but we don't know who originated it. Um, but I love it, you know, and that's kind of like how I live my style. I'm very Italian, got a very Italian family. My two older brothers, Joey and Vinny, I'm very close with my mom and dad who are fucking great. Uh, my cousins, aunts and uncles, we're all very close. Um, obviously, we fucking make great food, the best food there is. Um, so that's just how, who I am. That's just how I carry myself as well. It's just very fitting. Does it have anything to do with Chael Sonnen? Nope, nothing to do with Chael Sonnen. Although I think he's the fucking man. He's one of my favorite fighters of all time. Did you grow up an MMA fan? Yeah, absolutely. I always knew that once I was done with my wrestling career, I was going to transition into MMA. But you know what? When I have a goal in mind, I'm just obsessed with that goal. I have tunnel vision on that goal. So I, of course, cared more about wrestling than MMA during my career, just because if I wanted to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish, I just needed my sights on that. So, of course, my tunnel vision was on wrestling. But when the wrestling, you know, wasn't there, I would always turn to MMA and uh, fucking I always was always excited about my fighting career. You know, I think I was a great wrestler because I'm a great fighter. You know, sometimes it was hard during my wrestling career to be like, oh, fuck, we still got a couple of years until we fight, you know. But obviously, I wanted to stick to fucking wrestling for then and be very focused on that. But in the back of my mind, I was like, dude, I can't fucking wait to fight. Get me out of this wrestling where I can actually bash someone's fucking face in, make them bleed, elbow them, kick them in the fucking head and slice them open and tap them and, and fucking make them go unconscious. You know, that's my true love is just beating the shit out of someone. Maybe I'm a sick individual, but nothing makes me happier and, and nothing's more fun to me than beating the fuck out of someone on national television in front of thousands of fucking people. You know, nothing's better than that. What about when you were growing up, college, whatever, did you get into fights a lot? You know, street fights, bar fights, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, in college and in high school, I was always getting in fights. Um, in college, I was probably on probation for a little bit, um, getting in fights, you know, me and my buddy, my senior year, uh, beat the fuck out of these two dudes that were visiting from Ohio State. They had a football game in there um, that weekend, and it was just unfortunate because, you know what, these dudes are talking shit to us. Obviously, we're not going to let that slide. We had to fucking beat the shit out of them. Um, but unfortunately, they wanted to press charges on us. So oh. obviously, I was getting in trouble a little bit growing up with fights. Um, but you know what? Now I only fight for money. I only fight in the cage. Um, I do have a little bit of a temper. Sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes I am getting in bar fights or whatever, but I'm trying to be a little bit more smarter with that. I think I've become more mature with age, you know, just let someone go. Um, you know, I didn't have Twitter for a long time just because I was always afraid if I saw someone talk shit to me, I'd try to find out where they are, go find them and fucking put a brick through their head, walking out of work. 
Um, but I am a little bit smarter right now with it. I try not to get in as many fights, but of course, growing up, you know what? I was a little rascal getting in fights. When's the last time you got into a bar fight? Um, it's been a while, maybe a couple months. Uh, what? Nothing serious. A couple know? months. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't go in there to fucking just look for a fight or beat the shit out of people. You know, that's dumb. You know, I know that what's going to happen is it's a lose lose situation. Someone's going to talk shit to me. I'm going to beat the fuck out of them. And then they're going to try to charge me again. I know that's going to happen. It's fucking so dumb. I've been through it. And I, I hope that never happens again. You know, I'm not somebody that goes out there and looks for fights. You know, I, I don't. My only mind right now is fighting Landro Higo. That's it. But, of course, if someone's going to put their finger in my face or spin on me or something like that, obviously I'm going to have to put the fucking head through a fucking cement block. But, yeah, I, I try not to fight anymore. I'm never looking for a fight. If I'm out at a bar, there's always these tough guys. And it's always the same drunk guys who don't know how to fight, and it's the easiest fight there is. Um, so of course I'm trying not to fucking get in bar fights anymore. I'm trying to only fight in the cage, but you know what? Sometimes you just can't be a bitch. Uh, did you grow up a pro wrestling fan? Not so much. You know, I get that question a lot. The owner of ATT, Dan Lambert is yes. very much so involved in it. So ever since fucking he, I've been at ATT, I've kind of like grew a little bit more respect for it. Watched it a little bit more just because of him, but I didn't grow up too much of a fan of it. Wow, that is really interesting. I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that. Does Dan help you out with, uh, I mean, it all feels authentic to me, if I'm being honest, but he's a great guy on the mic. I mean, he is really good with those promos. Does he help you at all with any of it? No, not really, but Dan is an absolute stud. I think he's a fucking absolute character. He's hilarious on the TV. I mean, once they show his face on TV, I just immediately start laughing. <laughs> he's the man. Um, he just helps me with my MMA career. He doesn't help me with talking shit or anything like that. I actually don't believe in scripting things or being fake just because fans can tell when something's fake. And if it's scripted, you just start stuttering and they just tell that it's just fucking bullshit. Um, and, and so I don't really use him um, with any of that stuff. But with everything MMA related, I use him. He's the godfather of MMA. He's been around the block plenty of times. You know, he's the gym owner of the world's greatest gym. Um, so I use him with advice for like stuff like fighting and stuff like that, but never for trash talk. He just lets me do my thing. How long have you been at ATT for? I want to say three-ish, maybe four years. Okay. I uh, graduated from Purdue once my wrestling career was done and I moved back to Chicago. Um, and it was the year the Cubs won the World Series, which was absolutely fucking nuts. And so for like two weeks straight after the Cubs won the World Series, I was absolutely hammered. I mean, I swear to God, two weeks straight, we were just going fucking nuts. <laughs> all my friends lived in the city. We all just graduated from college. It was absolutely anarchy. And I kind of came to a decision where I was like, man, if I want to accomplish my goals in MMA, I need to make a big fucking change. So what I did is I packed up all my shit. I moved to South Florida and I went to the world's greatest gym. You know, I didn't know anybody in Florida at the time. I didn't know anybody at American Top Team. I just took this huge risk. I kind of showed up on their doorstep and just kind of said, hey, I'm here. Um, it's kind of wow. hilarious because the first day I snuck into their doors just thinking they wouldn't notice me. And uh, Richie, the gym manager, kind of came up to me and is like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> and I just kind of like described my situation and everything. So thank God they fucking took me and everything worked itself out. You know, it was a huge risk. It was a very scary fucking time. You know, obviously, when you don't know anybody, you have no family and friends in this state. You know, I don't know what jujitsu or Muay Thai or kickboxing is. I just knew I was going to be successful if I sacrificed. So that's what I did. I moved from Chicago to South Florida, and it's been fucking great. And where'd you sleep? I got an apartment. Wow. I got an apartment before I was even accepted to the gym. Wow. I remember going on Zillow and everything, looking at all these apartments like, all right, well, I got to fucking do this. Um, so I got an apartment. The next day I fucking showed up at their gym. I kind of told Richie and Dan uh, that I already had an apartment. So it's like, hey, like if you guys don't let me come, you guys are kind of scumbags. <laughs> so they kind of had to. Um, I put them in a position where they couldn't really say no. Um, you know, a very, ATT is a very hard gym to get into. Even if you're in Bellator or the UFC, sometimes they still don't allow you to. Um, so I know I had to do something big and, and it's great because it all worked itself out. Was there anyone that, you know, uh, you know, there's so many great fighters, there are veterans, OGs that took you under their wing that kind of showed you the way early on. Yeah. Pedro Munoz. He was, he was one of them. 
Charles Rosa is also another one, Edson Barbosa. The good thing about ATT is, is it's a massive gym, but it's a very tight knit group. And we're always there to help each other. You know, it's crazy. You go on the match, you look one way and you got Adriano Marias, the fucking flyweight king in one. You look another way and you got um, Pedro Munoz who fucking took me under his wing. He was somebody that kind of showed me the ropes, told me what I should really do, uh, what classes I should be taking, the coaches I should get under my wing and everything like that. So He's somebody that's still there for me in my corner. He's got a big fight coming up against Sean O'Malley. I think he's going to knock him out. I got a big fight coming up. So it's just very exciting times for us. That's amazing. Uh, there was a guy that I feel like people will be inclined to compare you to, who was a big part of ATT for many years. You know, I'm talking about Colby Covington. Did you have a relationship with him? And how do you feel about people comparing you to him? Well, I'm team Masvidal all day. Masvidal is my boy. Um, he'll always be my boy and I'll always have his back. I wasn't there when Colby, I, I think I was there for uh, maybe a few months before he went to a different gym. So I didn't really know him too well. You know, obviously everyone's close. So you say what's up and all that. Maybe I high fived him a couple of times, but I don't like Colby. Um, I don't like the shtick. I don't do the uh, fake shit. I don't like involving religion, politics or family into things. That's just not my style. You know, I don't give a fuck about somebody's religion. I don't give a fuck about their politics. I don't give a fuck about their family. You know, when I talk shit, I only care about that person. When I say I'm going to beat the fuck out of Leandro Higo, he's the only one I fucking care about. I hope his family is happy and healthy and he has a great fucking at home life. My only thing is just I want to fucking beat the shit out of the guy in the cage. That's it. And I want to fucking torture him. Colby's a little bit different. I don't like when people compare me to him. He's fake and he involves a lot of shit that's unnecessary. I'll never do that. And I'll be masked all till the day I die. Respect. Um, what about this look, the hair, the glasses that like, where, where did you, is this just you? Yeah, that's just me. That's just me. If you saw me outside, I'd probably be wearing this. <laughs> Honestly, I only wear sunglasses indoors. I don't like wearing them outdoors because I'll get a fucking tan line and I'll look dumb. So I only wear them indoors. Um, the dyed hair is just more to be like kind of electric and piss off these fans. I know these guys are going to be like, oh, he looks like an idiot with the dyed hair. He calls himself the Italian gangster, but he's got blonde hair. So it's kind of to just say fuck you to all these haters and everybody that's clowning on me. Um I'm just having fun with it. I love it. And I think I look sick anyway. So whatever. That is amazing. And by the way, uh, have you ever been to Italy? Yeah. Yeah. Growing up, we used to go to Sicily a lot. My grandparents are from Palermo, Sicily. Um, but I got two older brothers, Joey and Vinny, between the uh, three of us. We always had sports going on. So when we got to about high school-ish, we stopped going on these family vacations to Italy. But yeah, Italy is the greatest place on earth. You can't get better food and better scenes than there are in Italy. And after I beat this fucking... Bitch, he go, and then that bitch starts, and then I win the fucking tournament. I'm going to be the first place I go is Italy. You're not a fan of Stotts? No, nah, Stotts sucks. And they say he's good at talking trash. He's not good at talking trash. He talks trash, but he's not fucking good at it. He stutters all the fucking time, and he's just cheesy. He has these lines made up in his head already that he makes sure to say. He scripts all his shit. I think it sucks. You know, I got a big fucking fight June 24th with Higo. Obviously, I need my fucking sights set on him. But it's hard not to think of Stotts because I'm going to torture him. That's a dude that has no way of beating me. With Higo, I might slip up. He might have this little bullshit pussy guillotine. But with Stotts, he has no finishing capabilities. That's going to be the biggest Bellator bantamweight fight in history. It's hard not to think about that fight. But of course, I just got to think about Ego for now. Man, that would be electric. You get by Ego, he wins. You got, you know, you two, I mean, young guys, great personalities. And then I would imagine, then you want Sergio, right? That's the ultimate goal. Well, the finals will be either Barzola or uh, that Magomed Russian dude uh, or Patchy Mix. But Patchy Mix sucks. We all know he's going to lose. Uh, but that's who I would see in the finals. And then once you win the finals, obviously I would have Sergio Pettis which is just a cakewalk. That dude sucks. I don't know how he has the belt in Bellator right now. I would smash him. That would be a first round easy finish. But of course, I don't like first round finishes. I actually am a fan of fighting where I want to see guys fucking go out there and bleed and beat the shit out of each other. So of course, I would wait till the later rounds. Uh, but that's just, oh my God, that's a dream come true matchup. I cannot wait till I beat the shit out of Sergio Pettis. Sergio Pettis sucks? 
Yeah, he sucks. He's terrible. Kyoji Horiguchi was dog walking him the whole fight, beating the shit out of him the whole fight. Kyoji Horiguchi, who's not a wrestler, not a grappler at all, was taking Sergio down at will. It was pathetic. So I think that's going to be the easiest fight of my career, really. I actually, wow. I was talking about it with my coaches the other day. We weren't game planning for it just because I have a lot of fights, but I kind of brought up the notion that I might fight him with my eyes closed just to make things fair. Um, but, you know, obviously they weren't in favor of it, but I could do that. I could fight Sergio Pettis with my eyes closed and kick the fuck out of him. By the way, be remiss if I don't ask, better bantamweight division, Bellator or UFC? What division am I in? <laughs> <laughs> that one, Bellator. We have the fucking best division in MMA, regardless of the fucking promotion. You look at our division, it's so fucking packed with guys. Um, and then obviously I'm there. I'm the best bantamweight on the planet. So Bellator is the best. But I really do think in terms of depth, our top eight are better than any other promotions top eight, no matter if it's UFC, PFL, one, whatever the fuck you want. Bellator's bantamweight division is the best. And that's why I'm so pumped about this fucking tournament is because once I win this tournament, I'll be recognized as the best bantamweight in the world, regardless of the promotion. You know, Bellator's bantamweight division is getting talked about a lot, and it should just because it's the best in MMA. What? Aljamain Sterling, Piotr Jan, Jose? Uh, come on. Aljamain, dude, I would kill Aljamain. Aljamain, that's a fight that, you know, obviously I can't call out these UFC guys because it's I'm just not going to fight them anytime soon. I'm in Bellator. It would be silly to call them out, but I would fuck Aljamain up. That's an easy fight style. Look at it stylistically. That's a fight that I would fuck him up in. Um, but obviously I, I just want to stick to Bellator right now. Right. You know, th those, guys are, th those guys are on my plate. But yeah, Aljamain, that, that's an easy fight. That's probably the easier fight than Higo or Stotts or any of these guys. Um, but yeah, Bellator's bantamweight division is the best in MMA. It's a big statement. I mean, I would argue that their 135 weight class is maybe their best, maybe along with 55 with Aljo and Jan and Aldo and Marab and Sanhagen, all these dudes, uh, you know, your boy Pedro, Sean O'Malley. And still you think that the top eight is better than the top. That's a big statement. Yeah, look at our fucking top eight with Magomed. With uh, Magomed beat Jan, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, with he did. Stotts, um, Sergio sucks. I don't. I don't want to put him in the conversation. But yeah, Stotts, Magomed, me, uh, Patchy Mix. If he you gets your back, he's very hard to get off. Barzola is pretty good. Uh, Higo's got some good wins. I think. I think we're better. Um, obviously, they got a good division. You know what, Bellator or bantamweight, just in general, is very exciting right now. Um, but when you look at their wrestlers like Marab, who can't hold anybody down, all he does is mat return people. They account him for takedowns, but it's just a mat return. He fucking can't hold anybody down. He'll take you down, but you'll be able to get up. I mean, it's pathetic. I would dog walk Marab also. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very serious. And I really, really do think that Bellator Bantamweight division is the best in MMA. And again, it just makes it so much sweeter with this tournament. And I love that it's a tournament because a lot of times when you don't have a tournament, you can pick and choose who gets your title fight. No, I get to fucking go through a tournament. I get to go through the fucking ringer where nobody can say shit. I had to go through everybody to get this fucking uh, championship. Uh, just a couple of last things. What do you do with the million dollars if you win it? I don't want to even want to think about that right now. I'm not a huge money guy. You know, obviously the money's going to be nice. I can think of a zillion different things to do. You know, most of which include models on a yacht in Sicily, but I could probably do that right now. Um, so I'm just more focused on being the best bantamweight in the world. Um, I, I don't really care too much about the fame or or legacy or money or anything like that. You know, people want to say that they do this for legacy, like when they're dead, they want their name to carry on. Dude, I don't give a fuck. I'll be dead. I won't even be able to have a chance to care. So who gives a shit? I just want to have fun right now. You know, I got these goals written down that I need to accomplish. I'm a very goal centric person. Um, so to me, it's just have fun and winning is, is, is fun to me. So I got to just win this fucking tournament. And what that means is just, I had fun with it and, and I accomplished my goals. And that's really all I give a fuck about. Everything else will come. Everything else is nice. You know, that million dollars is fucking nice. I, I mean, I'm going to party my nuts off. It's going to be sick. <laughs> But I, I need to fucking win. And that's what's most important to me is being the best fighter on the planet. But top three goals that you have on that list, what are they? Well, number one, it's just to be the Bellator Bantamweight champion. That's it. There's obviously little goals 
that I want to do. You know, I go into each fight. I told you, of course, with these little yeah, goals, yeah. one of which is 23 to 29 stitches on Higo space. Right. But I have the ultimate goal of Bellator Bantamweight champion. And then I want to keep that. You know, I said earlier that I want to retire in Bellator. That's what I do want to have. I want to have 50 fucking title defenses in Bellator and retire when I'm 56 years old in Bellator. Yeah. So I love it. obviously the ultimate goal right now is to win this fucking tournament, get that strap around my waist, talk shit, have fun doing it. And I think I'd, I'm going to make it look easy too. I, I really want to dominate these guys, but you know what? The ultimate goal right now is just become the champion. By the way, does it annoy you when people compare you to Joe Pesci voice wise? I don't really give a fuck. Joe Pesci's the shit. If you want to compare me to him in a derogatory way, that's fine. Come say it to my face. I bet you won't. You know, all these little bitches that are online talking shit. It's so funny because if I saw them on the street, they'd ask for an autograph. Not one of them is going to come up to me and talk shit. So, yeah, call me Joe Pesci. Call me whatever the fuck you want. I don't give a shit. I'm having fun, and I'm going to beat the shit out of these dudes. I, I really don't care. But I love it. When they fucking mention me, you know, when I have this whole fucking division and Bellator mentioning my name, I love it. You guys can talk awesome about me you can praise me you can talk shit about me i don't give a fuck i love it either way last thing and this has been unbelievable exceeded my expectations and they were pretty damn high going in uh any if if leandro or his team are watching uh, any message to leandro higo who you are meeting in about 10 days time yeah this fight can go anywhere you know it could go on the feet it could go on the ground i'm better than this motherfucker everywhere so this is a, a fight where I have a set game plan. I don't want to give it too much away just in case he goes listening. You know, of course, if he is listening, he go, go fuck yourself. Um, but yeah, <laughs> this fight will go anywhere. It'll go on the feet. It will also go on the ground. It's going to be a complete mixed martial arts fight. And I'm just going to make it fun. I'm going to welcome him to hell. And I'm just going to slice open his fucking face. I'm going to torture him. And it's going to be very, very exciting. Man. Italian gangster, Danny Sabatello. Well done, my friend. Incredible stuff. We need characters like you in this game, and Bellator needs characters like you, and you are doing a phenomenal job. I'm a fan. I can't wait for your next fight. June 24th, as you said, Mohegan Sun. You got the great Gegar Musasi on the card, but dare I say, this is the people's main event right here. Danny Sabatello versus Leandro Ego. Phenomenal first appearance on the show, and something tells me it's uh, the first of many. So thank you so much for the time. Good luck to you on June 24th. Can't wait to have you back on. Absolutely, Ariel. Thank you. All right, there he is, the Italian gangster himself. Wow, what an appearance. That was incredible. My God. This, th these are the characters that I love in this game. Now, it's nice. Uh, you get, you know, you get, you get the, the respectful guys, you get, you know, the, the, the martial arts, but then sometimes you need a Danny Sabatella to just stir the pot, drop some F-bombs, and I know off the bat, people are going to be like, ah, oh, it's Colby Covington. Ew, it's Colby Covington 2.0. But ah, you, you get a different vibe. You get a vibe that if you went out to get a coffee with this guy, it's the exact same thing. That's the vibe I get. Maybe I'm falling for it, but that's the vibe I get. That he is that exact same kind of guy. And like I said... Man, do they need a shot in the arm over there. They need a shot in the arm over there. And I love the fact that he is not buddy-buddy with Stotts. You would think maybe the, the two younger guys. Uh, he, I mean, he can really mix things up over there. And it's a great, it's a great tournament. It's a solid card, by the way, on June 24th. Gegar Musasi versus Johnny Eblen. 11-0 Musasi coming back. And he is on a roll. You can make a case that he's the second best middleweight on the planet. Leandro Ego against Danny Sabatello, Magomed, Magomedov against Enrique, Enrique Barzola, Brendan Ward returning against Cassius Kane, Brent Premis against Alexander Shabley, Katzengano returning against Pam Sorensen. Uh, you got Anatoly Tokov, Saba Homasi, uh, Alejandro Lara, Cody Law returning. Remember him? He was the one who predicted the exact second to the second of his. Uh, Last fight, the finish, the time of the finish. He predicted it. Uh, it's a, How many fights are on this card? 15 fights on this card. I mentioned this yesterday on uh, Twitter. Bellator seems to be in a groove now where they're having uh, one fight a month. And I think this is much better, deeper cards, better main cards. This is, in my opinion, just what the doctor ordered for, uh, for Bellator. So that's next Friday, 
on Showtime, Friday, June 24th. Uh, part of the reason why I wanted to have uh, Danny on today, I didn't mention this at the top, I'll remind you at the end, no shows next week. I apologize for that. We are off next week, Monday and Wednesday. It's a national holiday, uh, national holiday here on Monday. And uh, I will be uh, back home in La Belle Provence. I haven't uh, been home with my kids since August. The last time I was home with my kids, uh, home meaning Montreal, I was, uh, it was the week before I came here to, to restart the whole damn thing. It was after the surreal gun, uh, Derek Lewis fight. It's been almost a year, 11 months. So it's long overdue. Always great to be home. Uh, it's also St. Jean Baptiste on June 24th. Also my mom's birthday on June 24th. Mama knows, uh, you got the F1 this weekend, Montreal on fire. Shout out to my good friend, uh, Danny Rick in Montreal right now. Hopefully he's able to get back on track literally and figuratively, and uh, win at uh, Circuit Gilles Villeneuve. You big uh, F1 fan, Frank? I feel I feel like you are. I like it, but I don't follow it. You don't follow You watch uh, Drive to Survive? Uh, that's the reality TV show, right? No, mm-hmm. I haven't watched it. By the way, can you hear me now that, you know, there's a couple things with the mic. You can hear me just good? Yeah, in fact, could you refrain from being silent at all so I can just make sure it's constantly working? Okay, you want me to just keep going? Yeah, and that voice, too. What about Danny Sabatello? What did you think of him? I um, We were trying to count how many times he dropped the F-bomb. Amazing, we, right? We lost count. You like that kind of character? Yeah, it was cool. Joe Pesci, right? I'm not going to say that. Why? I asked him the question. He seemed to be, you know, like, who would say that to my face? <laughs> right, that's When I true. think Joe Pesci, I think of Home Alone. And that's a Chicago movie, and he's a Chicago guy. Is this true? I'm a big fan. <laughs> You got to love a guy who comes on the show and within the first 10 seconds, he's ripping the fans. Yeah, it was pretty funny. He's effing this, these effing that. Oh, it's great. All right. So those are the interviews for today, but still a lot of show left. We got to answer your questions on the nose and uh, we got to see what's up there. Moderator Lewis has curated the best questions of the week. And in a moment, we're going to check in with our good friend GC. I bet GC, GC's probably, if he's watching this right now, I hope he's not because... If he's on vacation, you probably shouldn't be watching. But you know what? Maybe maybe he is. What do you think? Do you guys think he's watching live right now or not? No. Probably not. I mean, it is 940 over there, right? Yeah, so he should be out living it. He should be out living it. Well, Sabatello feels like the kind of guy that he would buy a t-shirt for. Like, yeah, for sure. He's big into the merch. Um, so we'll see if he's able to uh, find any Sabatello merch. I feel like they need to make some Italian gangster merch for Sabatello. We'll check in with GC. He has sent us his picks, and uh, I believe he is in Italy right now, or I believe he was in Italy whenever he sent it or is in Italy. I don't know. It's hard to keep up. But first, a quick word from our good friends over at DraftKings Sportsbook. Ooh, nice. Guys, game six, tomorrow night, Warriors up 3-2. Who was the guy who said Warriors in six? Before the finals, who is that guy? Oh, yeah. Will it happen? Can I just say something? And this is going to offend, you know, our good friend, Crypto Joe, but nothing would make me happier. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for saying it, but you guys know this is no surprise. Nothing would make me happier than the Warriors winning on the parquet in Boston. There are no more insufferable fans in sports than Boston sports fans. No one. I mean, you, you show up there with your T-shirts and your chants and your F this and your F that. I mean, there are kids watching. There's kids at the game. And you're acting like that. It's reprehensible. And so they could use a little uh, humble pie, if you will. The dubs led by Maple Jordan himself, Andrew Wiggins, going back to Beantown. Let's not win. And yes, I say us. Let us not win in San Francisco. Let us win in Boston. And let's shove it down. Okay, sorry. Uh, Are you ready for the NBA champs to be crowned? Join the finals action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can make any $5 NBA bet and get $150 in free bets instantly. Looking to turn another small bet into a big payday during the NBA finals with DraftKings? Same game parlay. You could do just that. This NBA season, a customer place. Get this. A $5 same game parlay and won over $5,000. 
Create your own parlay by combining multiple bets like which team will win, total threes made, total rebounds, and more. And boom shakalaka, you have a shot and even bigger payout. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code DMAR. Make it any $5 bet during the NBA Finals. Again, $150 in free bets instantly. That's promo code DMMA hour only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Unofficial. Sports betting partner of the NBA. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Go Warriors. Go Dubs. Close it out. Game six. All right. GC and Helwani time. Uh, big UFC this weekend. They are in Austin, Texas. You know, Austin is on my very short list of places in the United States that I've not yet been to and that I'd really like to go to. The top three, actually, there used to be a top three. Now it's a top two, but I still consider it a top three, and I'll explain why. Uh, Number one was New Orleans, and I went there for like two days. The first NBA game I did for ESPN was there, which was cool, but it was pouring rain, and uh, I didn't really get to see much. I did get to have some beignets with the great Mike Breen, incredibly so. I don't even know how that happened. At Café du Monde, are you familiar with Café du Monde, Frank? I'm not. What? You're not familiar with Café du Monde? I mean, the world-famous beignets at Café du Monde? You know I can't have gluten, right? Oh, I didn't know that. I'm sorry. Uh, Have you ever been to New Orleans or Nolens? Uh, Yeah, but as a child. Hmm. So that's number one. I'd like to go back and spend, you know, a couple days there, although my first time was pretty crazy. Uh, Austin, Texas, and Portland, Oregon. Have you been to either of those? I've been to Austin several times. Uh, Is Austin as great as people make it out to be? Maybe if you're in your 20s. Okay. Um, What about Portland? Haven't been to Portland. It's on my list. You ever have the Voodoo Donuts? Also, those have gluten in them as well. Yeah, that's right. Also, you've never been to Portland. Anyway, the UFC is going to be in in, uh, Austin this weekend. That's exciting. Yeah. Uh, Calvin Cater versus Josh Emmett, Donald Cerrone versus Joe Lozon, Tim Means versus Kevin Holland, Joaquin Buckley against Albert Duryev. Uh, who else is on this? Guram's back. That's cool. Julian Marquez, Adrian Yanez, uh, Court McGee, Jasmine Yessa Davises, Carter Ramos, Cody Stamen, Eddie Wineland, Kyle Dacus, Phil Hawes, Deron Wynn back after retiring briefly uh, late last year. So there's a lot to like. I got to be honest with you guys. I haven't looked at any of the odds. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit down on my luck. Quick look here. Oh, there's a lot of MMA going on, isn't there? Uh, there's also PFL. Jeez Louise, there's a lot going on. I I don't have. We're we're gonna go to GC's thing here in a second, but yeah, you got uh, ACA PFL four KSW seventy one. PFL on next week at the same time as Bellator, which should be interesting. Ooh, the great Clay Collard returning. Cassius Clay. Also, Jeremy Stevens against Miles Price. Olivier Aubin Mercier. Um, Tun Schult. Marcin Held. So, yes, a lot to like. Uh, I didn't really look at the odds. Let me see here. Uh, Cater. Damn it. Plus 190. That's interesting. Cater looking good. Joe Lowe's on plus 145. That's interesting. Uh, Kevin Holland's a favorite. Uh, just looking here. Any underdogs? That I can uh, grace you with. Um, yeah, ooh, Eddie Wyland plus 400. That's interesting. Uh, Deron one plus 210. Hmm, not sure where he's at. In any event, there's a lot to like. There's a lot going on. You don't want to hear my picks. Uh, no one likes to hear my picks. We want to hear from GC's picks. So I understand uh, he has sent us his picks. Last week, he freaking knocked it out of the park. It was a great, great video with him live. He was live en direct. Du uh, Tour Eiffel à Paris. He was standing in front of the uh, the Eiffel Tower. He had the microphone. He had the whole setup. He had the hat, the music, the intro. I can't wait. I'm going to sit back here, drink my green tea. I'm going to see what GC has cooked up for us this week. Without further ado, here are his best bets. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I love it. Westphalia, by the way. Someone noticed that. Look at that music. Oh, looks like we're going to Italy. Fitting after Sabatello, right? The Italian gangster. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Hold on. I'll be down in one sec. Oh, this is nice. 
Sorry about that. Uh, as you can see, we've made it to the beautiful villa in the wow. Italian countryside. I mean, look at this garden. It's it's really just a thing of beauty. I, I thought about doing another hit in front of an Italian monument, something very famous and picturesque, but I heard just the constant belly aching and whining from Mysterious Frank last week in front oh. of the Eiffel Tower. He said the audio was just terrible. So I decided to do him a favor and do it here at my villa in the secluded Tuscan countryside of Italy. Uh, as far as Italy goes, a little more somber last week heading into UFC 275. They were supposed to see the Italian dream Marvin Vittori fight. Unfortunately, right. that fight got called off. Now they have to wait till oh, September. So they were a little sad not to see their uh, prodigal son fight last week but <laughs> or that's prodigal. all gone now a new energy has completely swept across this country all of italy is on fire as we look towards wow. ufc austin the whole country they won't stop talking about it <laughs> so i don't want to make this beautiful country wait any longer let's get right into the picks last oh, yeah. week another rough week for me joanna zhang that knockout hurt me bad but Hopefully we can find ourselves back in the green this week. I mean, we're just hemorrhaging units over here in Europe. So I am hoping that this is going in to Europe. be a green week. Let's get right into it. First up, oh. also bear with me here on the lines. Took these weeks ago before I left the States. Wait, can you pause it right there? Can you pause it? Night over uh, yes, I'm happy you said that because then you're going to get people who say, Ew, where did these lines come from? Show us your slips, bro. Okay, please continue. I think it's that voice that's breaking the microphone. <laughs> please continue. Roman deletes, yes, deletes, three and one in the UFC, but all three of his wins are against people cut from the roster, and they have a combined UFC record of two, ten, and one. Next up, Gregory Rodriguez, Robocop. Should be a great fight while it lasts, but I think Robocop, more well-rounded. I think he gets it done here. I think he's reading then this. we'll take Demir's Magulov over Garam. This low-key... Could be the fight of the night. Cannot mm -hmm. wait for this one. I think whoever you bet on, you're going to come out a winner. But I hope I'm actually a winner, cashing a ticket on the mirror. Lastly, main event, Calvin Cater. Oh. He looked great against Giga. Was on the wrong side there. Won't make the same mistake again here. I think he gets it done against Josh Emmett. Said I wasn't going to add anything else in my tweet. But forgot Cerrone Lozon was on this card. Oh. Had the under two and a half a couple months ago when they were supposed to fight. Have it again here. Don't think this one lasts long. I think we cashed the under two and a half with relative ease. Then two parlays for you. Cody Stamen and Adrian Yanez. Juiced up, but I like them both to win. Then Phil Haas, the size and reach. This is going to be too much for Duran Wynn. And then Kevin Holland. <laughs> I mean, how that's can I bet against a local superhero? That's right. All right, that's all I've got this week. Five singles. Wow. Two parlays. <laughs> Put a lot of strings to get you on this villa. You don't got to go home. You just got to get the hell out of here. See you next week in the States. Arrivederci. Wow. What a see! Oh, cannonball! That was incredible. I mean, can we just give it up for GC? Can we get some clapping? What do we got, Frank? Anything? That, I mean, that is amazing. I th I think that one was better than the first one. There were multiple locations in that one. First on the balcony, then down the balcony, then in the pool. That's very observant. Yeah, I mean, it, it took a long time to recap it all in my brain. Uh, very, very impressive stuff. And again, shout out to the uh, the camera man or woman. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Am I allowed to say who's taking? It looked like it was like on a try. It looked like a full like multi cam shoot. I think his girlfriend could be considered a tripod, right? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, but you know, I know she's like a big you know TV star as well. So I wasn't sure if we were. I mean, you just went ahead and revealed it. For a mysterious guy, I mean, you just kind of came out with that information. We don't know if it's her or not. Oh, you're just saying, okay, yeah. in general. I mean, who knows? Maybe they think she's, you know, at the office right now. So I didn't want to, you know, there's probably people watching like, wait a second, what? Yes, you know? her employers are watching the show. Actually, I mean, just on Monday, we had someone who works at the same place as her text me saying that they were watching. Do you remember that whole exchange? I do. And who's doing more details? Beep. Than... Beep. 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 That's the sound of... Mysterious Frank uh, backtracking, but the, the camera angles were great. The shot was great. And uh, GC, once again, coming through. Great picks overall. I, I actually, I made a promise myself that I'm, as far as like an H Dow, I'm never going to go against him because he knows a hell of a lot more than me when it comes to this stuff. And last week we went against him. So while I was maybe thinking for a moment there, Emmett, underdog, he went with Cater. I can't do it. I don't have it in me right now. I'm being honest. Now, the intro 
You think that was custom because there was someone on Twitter who said, wow, look at the detail. There's even a Westphalia, which I have talked about wanting to buy at some point. It's like a bucket list thing for me. And GC kind of said like, yeah, you're like, cool. Yeah, yeah, thanks for noticing. If we go back to the intro, do you think he actually customized that? Or do you think that, let's take a look no. here. Do you think this is a generic thing that he, I mean, I there's- he found an asset and- no, Look, there's a Westphalia right there. There's also a palm tree. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things. Uh, there's a camel. My family's from Egypt. Right. I mean, there's a lot of connections there. What about that villa? That looks incredible. I have to be honest. Looks way nicer than wherever we're at here in New York City. I mean, New York is great and all, but that seems pristine, serene, right? It is quite heavenly. Nice. Are you jealous? A little bit. Yeah. 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 Great food. You can't have any because you don't eat gluten. That's right. Could you have gluten-free pasta? Is that okay with you? Yeah, it's not the same. It's not the same. Pizza? Okay, I'm not actually gluten-free. Oh, you're not? No. What? Who makes to... a joke about that? Well, because you were like, oh, you haven't heard of this, please? After I said no. That's a bizarre thing to joke about. Really? Well. It... Which place? What was the place? Oh, New Orleans? Yeah. Oh, the beignet? Yeah. So your go-to is to just lie in that moment. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'll learn from mm. the best. Mm. Frank, what happened to the microphone during that incredible interview? I'm pretty sure that you did I did not. For instance, where's the laugh mic right now? I'm pretty sure I heard it fall on the ground. <laughs> it's on the ground, isn't it? No, it's not. Like, even when I listen to it, it no, sounds like a microphone it's on, on the ground. It's on the thingy here. What do you want me to do? Okay. Hold it? You want me to put it on? I mean, that was the idea. All right, fine. I'll put it on. Um, all right, well, great stuff there from GC. Them's the picks. They'll be online as well. I think he actually... Uh, tweeted them, and I think he had all of them except for the Cerrone one there, but he mentioned that as well, and uh, we look forward to his return. Now, we won't see him next week because we're going to be off next week, like I said, but we'll be back in two weeks' time, so that will be the week of International Fight Week. What's that Monday? The, the 27th. 27th. What are you going to do on the uh, the off week? Find other work to do. No, no breaks for you? No. Nothing? No. Not a single thing? No, no vacation. I'm sleeping. No beach. No none parties. Of none of it. None of it. All right. Much respect. I'll be in Canada. Have you ever been to Canada? No. Wow. But I did see You'd it. You'd start living, brother. <laughs> I was in uh, Washington and got to see the Victoria Islands across the uh, from the window. That was kind of cool. The what? There's such thing as a Victoria Islands, right? I didn't just make that up. Oh, like Victoria, British Columbia? Correct. Got it. So... I got to see them. Yeah, no. Uh, British Columbia is beautiful. Victoria, British Columbia, home of the great <clears throat> Steve Nash, two-time MVP. Anyway, uh, thank you to GC. Uh, safe travels home. Enjoy the rest of your trip. Thank you for doing that, by the way. No one asked him to do that. Uh, told him he could take the two weeks off, but shows the kind of commitment that he has for the program, and we appreciate that more than we know. Like, if Frank went away, I wouldn't hear from him for two weeks, right? I mean, you would just be like, fend yeah, for yourself. <clears throat> New York Rick's been away. I mean, he's like, you know, you know, what's your hat? Here's your hurry. <laughs> you know, something like that. I don't know what the saying is. How's your hat? Here's your hurry. What is the saying? I've never heard that saying. Rick, do you know what he's talking about? Oh. No, no idea. All right. Uh, hello, never Rick. How are you? Uh, Rick's presence being time now for everyone's favorite segment of the week. It is time. It's time for a good old fashioned Q&A, MMA fans. New camera angle. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived. Everyone talking about to it. hear from the man himself, Ariel Hawaii. thing Hawaii. in the biz. Live from the Box Studios in beautiful New York City. Beautiful. And now, to answer your questions, get out of your seats and on your feet because here he is, Ariel Helwani. All right, let's go. No time to waste. We got to answer some damn questions here. And then we ain't got to go home, but we have to get the hell out of here. All right, let's do this. Ooh, a first timer, I believe, to kick things off. How about that? Are you still rattled from the microphone thing? What's going on? Everything okay? Do you need a hug? Sometimes I'm not sure. Sometimes what we're you vibing. Sometimes we're vibing. 
Uh, this is from Steven Svitko. What's good, Ariel? I had a question about matchmaking this week. When the UFC is deciding who is fighting who, which executive has the most say when pitching ideas for fights? I know there's probably a committee or something, but does it solely fall in the hands of just a couple of people? Lately, I feel like there's been questionable matchups in odd locations that left plenty of us scratching our heads. Cough, Salt Lake City, cough. Do you think that the planning stages get so hectic they forget about the obvious pay-per-view draws? prime locations for our hometown fighters and young fighter promotion. How do they fix this? There's four people that are involved in the matchmaking process. Number one, Dana White. Number two, Hunter Campbell. Number three, Sean Shelby. Number four, Mick Maynard. As you all know, Mick Maynard and Sean Shelby have the uh, the weight classes divvied up. So they, they deal with their own weight classes. Like Mick has heavyweights and light heavyweights and middleweights. And I believe welterweights. Shelby has... I think 25, 35, 45, 55. Mick also has the women. And then for the really, really big fights, obviously Dana and Mick are involved. Excuse me, Dana and Hunter Campbell are involved. The one who's probably involved the most, especially with the big fights, uh, is Hunter. Hunter's the one doing the negotiations. He's the one really on the front lines, especially for the big fights, like the Nate Diaz situation, um, you know, a John Jones, a Stipe, a thing like that, you know, all that is is Hunter. It's very, very rare that Dana gets involved in the negotiations. It's very rare that he's on the front lines, that he's getting his hands dirty. It's really on Hunter now. And I will say, uh, even though I think he probably doesn't care for me or whatever, I don't know. I don't even know what he thinks of me. I've told you one time the story of him texting me saying like, hey, if you ever need anything, hit me up and then I never heard from him again. All good. I get it. But I will say most people actually speak very highly of the way in which Hunter does business in terms of not being too emotional, being sensible to a degree. Uh, it's not as kind of bullyish as it has been in the past. Uh, so he has been somewhat of a breath of fresh air in that regard. Obviously, there's going to be butting of heads. Obviously, there's going to be differences and whatnot. But I, I would say from most fighters and managers, in particular managers, because they're the ones dealing with that stuff, I hear uh, positive positive uh, feedback. Um, so that's that's the committee, if you will. The smaller fights will just be the two main matchmakers. I actually feel like they should have more. They need scouts. I mean, like, think about a baseball front office or a football or basketball or hockey front office. Like, there's scouts. There's a whole department. And really, in terms of signing... And, and matching up those fighters up until you get to like the creme de la creme. It's really on Mick and Sean. And for the longest time, it was just Joe Silva. And then they brought over Sean and then Joe left and Mick came in. And then you have, you know, Dana Lorenzo at the top now, Dana and Hunter. Dana, very much a non-factor when it comes to this stuff now. It's really Hunter. And that's not me throwing shade. I think he would be the first to tell you that as well. Um, you can make a case for them having more and needing more, but it works. Hugo, hey, Ariel, with Jose Aldo and Marab potentially fighting, where does that leave Corey, Henry Cejudo, and Piotr Jan? Cheers and go the Crows. Yes, go the Crows. Um, Lewis tells me that the next question is about Cejudo too, so maybe I'll team them up. Uh, has there been, thank you for that, Lewis. Great job, as always. Hagrid, has there been any word on if Henry Cejudo is definitely returning to the UFC? If so, who do you think slash want to see him make his return against? Personally, I think an event with Jones Stipe in the main and Cejudo Aldo in the co-main would be legendary. Um, well, I will tell you that what I reported yesterday is accurate. They are trying to book Marab versus Jose Aldo for that August 20th card in Salt Lake City. And so then you can deduce that they're going to go with uh, TJ and Aljo, maybe, maybe in the fall, maybe, um, maybe September. And uh, that would leave Corey available, uh, potential Corey versus Song Yadong. Um, and I think the Henry stuff is interesting, but Henry can only come back in October. Now, the original plan was Jan versus Cheeto Vera in August. I told you that was the plan. Jan couldn't come back. And then you have a situation where they go with Dominic Cruz instead. Maybe, and I'm not hearing anything because I think they want him to get through his testing thing. And maybe they've had preliminary talks, but maybe you go with Jan versus Cejudo. Like Cejudo wants big business. You win that fight, you get a title shot. I could also see them doing Aljo versus uh, Dillashaw and then just 
giving Cejudo the winner of that and he just returns, you know, early next year. But no real talk right now as far as who they'll match him up against. But the clouds are opening up at 35 and that is good news. McKinney, hi, Ariel. My question today is, do you believe the gap in competition has diminished significantly over the years between the champion of each weight class and the respective top contenders? My reasoning behind this is that most of the top divisions don't have the same mystique of an untouchable champion as they would have in the past and are essentially a two-horse race. For instance, Figgy Moreno, well, what does Kaikar France think of that? Volk Max, well, there's still some guys there. Usman Colby, don't tell Leon about that. Izzy Ra eh, I feel like this is a bit of a stretch. I get what you're saying, but it's more cyclical. It could just be that the skill level has increased so much with this era of talent that there's almost a more even playing field. I think there's more parity. I think there's more parity, and I think that's better. Adrian. Dear Ariel, oh, Adrian's the best. Um, I need to put my glasses on for Adrian because he always has those great life questions. Wow, what a difference my glasses make. Adrian, dear Ariel, greetings once again from London, Ontario, Canada. Firstly, I want to thank you for the kind and thoughtful cameo you did on behalf of my girlfriend. Yes, Emily, his girlfriend, uh, asked me to do one for their anniversary, and I did it, and it was very nice to realize that it was the same Adrian from on the nose. And uh, yes, there they are. This is amazing. I will get to that in a moment. Um, it made my day. What Emily failed to mention when requesting the cameo, however, is that the day of our anniversary is also her birthday. Although these two events are on the same day, she is insistent that they require separate dinners, gifts, and even cards. I disagree as I think that it is far more efficient to roll our anniversary and her birthday into one event with one gift. My question to you is, if a loved one has a birthday that falls on the day of another gift-giving event, example, anniversary, holiday, etc., do you consider grouping their gifts together to be socially acceptable? As always, appreciate your valuable insights. <laughs> I mean, it's a tremendous question. It really is. P.S., given that my girlfriend often comes up in my questions, a couple of posters have asked me to verify her existence. To do so, I've sent Lewis a photo of the two of us enjoying anniversary drinks, not to be confused with birthday drinks, which she tells me are somehow different. So we do have the photo evidence, right? The photographic evidence. There is Adrian and his lovely girlfriend, Emily, enjoying their birthday drinks. No, excuse me, anniversary drinks, not to be confused with the birthday drinks. This is a doozy of a question. And, you know, I'd love to ask the rest of the team as well. I lean towards grouping them together. If it just so happens that your birthday falls on Christmas, I'm okay with grouping them together. If it just so happens that your birthday falls on an anniversary, I'm okay with grouping them together, but I could also understand someone saying, no, we're keeping this separate. On the 13th, we're going to celebrate the anniversary, and on the 14th, we'll celebrate you. Um, I could see both ways. I would be inclined for myself to do it one night. I have a feeling if I asked my wife, she would say to separate them, or at least acknowledge them in separate ways. What do you think, Frank? I think it's a little weird. What is weird? Sending a picture of your girlfriend to prove that she exists just kind of makes it seem like she doesn't. Wow. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is a left turn? This is a whole different story that you're going with here. We're, we're just talking about what's exciting. You're, you th you're calling BS on Adrian in total. Like you're, 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 I'm just... I mean, even Lewis, when he sent me the photo, he was like, full disclosure, I haven't reversed image searched this. So wow. it's a possibility. <laughs> My mind doesn't even go there. You're the better person, I understand. Your mind goes there right away. Kind of. I hope, I mean, look, if it's a real picture, it's a lovely picture, it's great. I'm glad, but like, don't let the internet wow. force you to confirm or deny. Can we see the picture one more time? Is it a Photoshop, you think? What do you think? I mean, it's, it's a... Good composition, but wow. you could totally, you know, like all of that behind her head could just be green wow. screen. Wow. I mean, you've blown my mind. If what you a... look at the glass, you don't see his reflection in it. Whoa. <laughs> I wouldn't even consider for a second this is fake. Well, we... did you know they took the word gullible out of the dictionary? I, I, I think you've hit me with this one before. All right. Now, what, okay. Fugazi aside, catfish aside, what about the anniversary birthday dilemma that he's talking about? 
Yeah, Bo- I could see that. Both fall on the same day. Do you celebrate them separately or do you split them up? You se- separate them. You separate them. Right. You do two separate dinners. Two separate dinners. You know, one, it's like a, hey, this is for you. It's your birthday. But this one we're deciding communally because it's our anniversary. But it's the same people. Right. But it's not like you're throwing. Okay. So the anniversary is a couple, you know, like it's two people yeah. celebrating being together. So they get equal say. For the birthday, though, it should be all about the birthday girl in this case. Okay. Interesting. Uh, New York Rick? Yeah, you make things easy and combine them, of course. It's the only way to go. I had a feeling Rick would say that. Yeah, I mean, efficiency. What are we wasting time here for? I'm sure that would be a great topic to have at your anniversary dinner. Uh, can you ask the mm. uh, the lone female on the squad today, Lonnie, what does she think? Stand by one second. I don't know if she has the mic. It's all right. You can relay the uh, the message. Here she is. Hello. I would separate them. You would separate them? Yeah. So you would have two separate evenings, even though it's the same people, the same two people, it falls on the same day. Both of them are on the 15th of June. You would go out two separate times and say, this is for the anniversary. This is for the birthday. It is personal preference, but like I personally, I do a bunch of different things for my birthday with like different groups of people. Mm. It's like never, it doesn't have to be something big. It's just signifying like this one's about a single person, their birthday versus the couple. Okay, that is interesting. Now, which goes first, by the way? Does the anniversary come first, like the collective unit, or does the singular birthday celebration come first? I That doesn't necessarily matter. I think just scheduling wise. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, it's the same two people. So, you know, uh, it's a really interesting dilemma. And I'd like to believe that Adrian is sending us a real photo here. I think it's a real photo. I think so, too. I think that's just Frank's cold heart rearing its ugly head uh this is from carmelo hey ariel there's something really special about that anthony smith he elevates the believe you me podcast and not gonna lie his segment on your show monday was some of the best listening i've had with your show do you think you can have him keep popping up um on the show while gc is gone because boy new york rick's takes ah you see i'm just read i i I swear i was reading it and now i'm gonna stop i'm not even gonna say what he said uh new york rick because i don't want you to get mad at me again i'm stopping again no, let conti- please continue. I, I no, no, hear. I don't I'm want not. this. I don't want to uh, feed into my, this narrative. You're you're mis you're misrepresenting once again. Not not shocking. Uh, <laughs> it's it's you. It's not the people. It's me. Are, I'm not the one saying it. it. You are you're welcoming it. You are you are creating the environment for it, and then going who me? You put your hands up. Let me. I'll do a voice now. Who me? I didn't do this. <laughs> and then pretending like you. And then pretending like you're not culpable for it. Wow. You're really going to, but I'm the one stopping from reading this. Yeah. But even this conversation about it is bringing light to it, is bringing attention to it, giving air to the. No, because if I read it, then you say, then you say, oh, why did you read it? You're feeding it. No, I don't care about that. You think, I mean, Sabatello nailed it. You think I care about these loser jabrones who like, oh, you have a bad take? No, it's not that. That's not the that's not the gripe. They they don't know what the hell they're talking about. So of course I don't care about that. It's uh it's your um it's your support of it. It's your it's your cultivation of it. Wow. Okay. Let him read it. I don't care. All he said was New York Rick's takes ain't cutting it. No idea what he's talking about. Cyborg pound for pound. That's all he said. New York Rick's takes ain't cutting it. Yeah, I mean, check Cyborg's Twitter. Yeah, Speaks she's giving you props. How about that? Is that yeah. I mean, th- check by the way, Cyborg's Twitter. Far from one of your worst takes. I mean, far. Not. I mean, not even the stratosphere. You can make. Yeah, your take. reaction to it on Monday. No, didn't, uh, listen, wasn't commensurate with that. As wow, said, See, this... everything is. Why are you so mad, you know, bro? Not of equal measure. No, I'm not mad. You asked. You asked. You asked me what the uh, the genesis of this is, and I'm telling you. What about that, Danny Sabatello? Where does he, that rank? Tremendous. And again, you know, like I get it. I get exactly what he's saying. It, it, uh, he, he was speaking. He was speaking to me there. What about the uh, haters? A lot of these MMA fans that think they know things that really don't. You mean these ones? Ew, why don't you have 275 fighters on the car? I think you'll be surprised to know how many of those people are the same ones asking. Wow. Here. I think you'll be shocked to know that. Uh, you have some, uh, 
you have some people in your house that you might not want. Well, it sounds like Carmelo wants to have Anthony Smith on the show as a uh, repeating guest. I love Anthony. He's the man. Now, what do I do about this situation? Can I just ask you guys? There's a manager who keeps texting me. He's texting me three times. Let me ask you, seriously, New York Rick. He's saying, hey, can you give me a call back? This is at 103. So we're already live. He's a manager, a prominent manager in the sport of MMA. Then he texts me back at 305, two hours later. I'm still on the air. Nothing, question mark, with a sad face. Then he texts me at four, so 13 minutes ago, and says, hey, are we good? Call me. How should I feel about this? I'm live on the air. If you follow me on social media, you probably know I'm live on the air. I've been doing the Wednesday show now for almost a year. Sh I mean, like, should I be offended by this? Should I call no. him right now? Yes. Call him right now on the air. You have to forgive him for not knowing, and but you also have to expect that he forgives you for the urgency of his text without the knowledge. So you you have to give him grace, and then he has to return the grace. Meaning he has to say, oh, I didn't realize you were on air. I'm so sorry. Now I understand. Uh, not keep the hard line stance. So you have to give each other grace. Wait, but does that mean I call him right now? Sure, go for it. I mean, I just feel like and you're... demand grace. Well, you're invited. You keep asking me, what's up? How's it going? I'm live on the air. Did what? you reply with it? It sounds important. Let's find out. All right, we're finding out. Now I'm going to tell him. Let's see here. Brian, I, I, we're live on the air right now. I'm on, I'm on the air, and, and I'm reading oh, your text messages. Uh, you're, so you're on the air right now. Just, I just want to let you know. Uh, I'm reading your text messages, and I've asked my crew how I should feel about the fact that you have sent me three text messages while I've been live the entire time. At 103, at 305, and at 415. Uh, I was just giving you shit based off of our last comment. I know, but how should I feel about the fact that I'm alive on the air? I've been doing this Wednesday I program. Live on the air, bro. So should I feel offended by the fact that you didn't know that? That you were giving me, you know, tongue-in-cheek shit, but yet not knowing that I'm live on the air? How should I feel about this? And why... Do you need me to call you so, like, what is so urgent? Now we're live. Can I tell the people who I'm talking to? I'm talking to the great Brian Butler of Sucker no, Punch. No, no. Uh, he's one of the most oh, prominent so managers in MMA. You on your little burn back to me after my screenshot. Sure. You say that uh, I never show you love, this, that. Here you are on the program, live on the air, and yet you have uh, texted me multiple times today. This is awesome. Yes. What is so important? What do we need to talk about? I can't tell you on live air. Oh, you can't? No, are you kidding me? Oh, okay. So should I call you after the show? Yes, you should call me when you are done. And did you think that I was ignoring you? Did you think, oh, what's up with Ariel? No, oh, hey, let me check his not. Twitter. I was fucking with you because of <laughs> the last little bit of yes. banter that we had. Did you not know I do a show on Wednesday? Should I be offended by that? You know, I keep forgetting because your show was just on Mondays. And yeah. And you switched your schedule up, and I just can't keep up with schedules with all the stuff that was on there. You know. All right. That's, that's all it is. Well, I want—I didn't want because we still have you know another forty-five minutes. I didn't want you worrying and texting me again if we're good. So I just wanted to let you know I am here. I still love you and respect you dearly. But I'm doing a live program right now. If there's something you'd like to break to the audience, they'd love to hear it. Oh no no no! It's it's literally me giving you shit over something else, and it's well. totally. All right. Yeah. I, I will Just call you when we are done. Sounds good, man. All right. Take care. There he is. Uh, the great Brian Butler of Sucker Punch Entertainment. Uh, I mean, I feel like that was warranted, right? I mean, we're on the air. Patrick. All is well that ends well. Yes. Favorite segment of the week, two quick questions. When the UFC holds an event overseas, do they fly all the staff over privately? No. What are you, crazy? Privately? They sitting, I mean, you're lucky if you get business class or do they fly them commercial? What about DC Anik? No, they're flying commercial. Do you not see them on Instagram and whatnot? Any update on whether you and DC will reunite for something during International Fight Week? Wow. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, what do you mean by reunite? Like doing a show? No, I would be shocked. But you never know. Honestly, didn't even think about it. He's got a big week. He's doing the show. He's getting inducted. P.S., Oh, wait, here's a, here's a, a positive New York Rick comment. This is good. P.S. I love New York Rick. There's a but. 
But him rating Special K as the best cereal of all time is almost as bad as that one judge that scored the fight 49-46 for Valentina. He threw me a curveball. I thought he was going to say no, I can accept that. Um, subjective. Uh, but he's oh, wrong. I'm sorry. Here he is. Yeah. I, I can accept that, but they're wrong, obviously. Yeah. Um, again, you know, I'm just here to deliver the truth. Um, how you people take it is is up to you. I'm I'm once once I deliver that truth, now it's up to you to to consume and, and do with what you will. Um yeah, you know what? Maybe maybe I'm gonna ju- jump over, see what Sabatello is doing. We should do something together, me and that guy. By the way, so, what's uh, happening with you and Killisha? Like you were friends, now you're not friends, you unfollowed him on Twitter. What's going on? Oh no, incessant. Just can't just can't deal with the kid anymore. Too much. Sorry. He took he took a good thing and then he just he ruined it over the head a, li- a little too much. Not invited to the housewarming? No, 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 no. Invitation we're, we're revoked, gone. rescinded. Everybody but him is invited to the uh, wow. housewarming now. Sorry, Killer Show. Frank, Actually, you not sorry, to... not sorry, Killer no. Show. Frank, you going to the housewarming? No. Wow. Okay. I don't know. Damn. If all right. Not invite uh, Frank and Killer Show. <laughs> Both invitations rescinded. Um, El Cubano, hola Ariel, greetings from beautiful Miami, Florida. My question this week is if you can match up anyone with Kevin Holland for the entertainment purpose of just listening to banter back and forth and it was guaranteed to go the distance, who would you pick to hear him go at it with Big Mouth? Personally, I'd love to hear 25 minutes of Holland and Strickland going back and forth while going to war at the same time. That's, I mean, that's an incredible one, although Strickland is 85 right now and uh, Holland is 170. I'll throw out Nate Diaz. Habib Nurmagomedov, those would be good ones. Yeah, but the, I mean, Diaz 170, not not Habib, right? What do you mean? Uh, he's 170 now. Has to be his weight class, no? Yeah. Um, no, what, I mean, what? Those guys wouldn't come up and fight Kevin Holland? Like, yeah, in a fine. fantasy world, those guys couldn't stay in a cage with Kevin Holland? Like, that they, I think they'd both be all right. What about Bilal? No. <laughs> not, a, not a notorious... Uh, what about talker. Kobe? No. Also not a notorious right. talker, right? Like kind of just like yeah. what Kobe? Oh, during the fight, you mean? Isn't this literally the yeah. question? Yeah, I know. I just uh, the build up. Uh, Taco enthusiast. Hi, Ariel. Bear with me, but I have a judge's transparency solution based on experience. I used to work as a director and scorekeeper for a kids' dance competition tour. While quite the opposite of a cage match, the scoring was equally as subjective and consisted of three judges that were oftentimes terrible at their jobs. Side note: kids' dance competitions are definitely fixed. Wow. That is pretty nuts. Anywho, uh, to make scoring transparent, we equipped the judges with a microphone attached to a computer where they literally talked through what they liked and didn't like about each performance. Mm. Their audio was recorded essentially at the end of the competition. Competitors received the audio from each judge and the comments they recorded were also made available online for public. Not bad. Imagine this with MMA. Even if a judge doesn't talk much, hearing them say that's a takedown or amazing ring control at least gives you insight into their thinking that led to their scoring. Do you think this could be translated to MMA? Did I just fix judging? You fixed judging. He fixed judging. He fixed judging. Um, I think it would be very valuable to the commissioners, to the commissions. I don't know if you want to make that public public, uh, but I, I actually think that that could be very interesting just to gain some insight. Now, some of the best commissioners like to do a download after the fact. Uh, you know, I don't know if all of them do that. I don't think all of them do that, but this could be really interesting. Freeze about a controversial play, moment, game, whatever. And uh, he'll, it'll be just one guy and then the answers get disseminated to all the media sources. I would love something like that. Okay, uh, at UFC 276, the... That's very interesting. Like the old school one. Frank, not this Frank. Frank Prochaska said, very nice, very nice in the post-fight scrum because it sounded like Borat. It did. Very nice. Very nice. Was it on purpose? He's got a colorful and tongue-in-cheek persona. For me, it seems as though that division never had as many. We're caught up in the moment, but CM Punk's pipe bomb in the moment felt a lot bigger to me. MJF's was great. Like, we're picking between two tremendous moments, but I like that MJF spoke about, you know, a lot more of the -the behind-the-scenes thing, just sitting there, you know, cross-legged and just shooting felt, I don't know, more impactful. Um, Both great, both amazing, both two of the all-time best, but if I had to pick one, I'd go with CM Punk's 
back in 2011. Work, shoot, or both, as in a work was agreed, but then he decided to shoot. No, I think it was 100% of work. Uh, two, it sometimes feels like WWE has become reluctant to give new guys the big push. If you had creative control, how that when he gets to the top, because you only have one chance to make that first impression. You don't want him to stumble. But yes, him with a Heyman type, an MVP type, I think is the way to go. Hello, Ariel. In the past five years, it seems like the UFC has signed one big free agent each year from another promotion. Uh, and they have exceeded the hype in every which way. Guys like Justin Gaethje, Izzy, Chandler, and Yuri are all must see TV and have been tremendous additions to the UFC. There are some of the most interesting or entertaining fighters in the octagon on the mic. I think Patty or Ian Gary are more recent signings that could potentially reach that level. Yes, but those were kind of, you know, it's different to sign a guy from, I don't know, a Ryzen as opposed to a Cage Warriors, a uh, Bellator as opposed to, you know, a Cage Warriors, in my opinion. Other than Kayla, are there any current fighters outside of the UFC that could come in and make an impact on the sport like we've seen from the aforementioned group? I've heard a lot of chatter about Roberto Soldich from KSW. Is he that good? And will he be the next big signing? No update just yet on Soldich. Sounded like UFC was the front runner, but no update just, just yet. Um, I think he could do, you know, as far as who else is out there that could be big business. Let's see. I mean, I'd love to see, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating for them to leave, but I'm just thinking of guys who are great, who are outside of the UFC. Musasi, obviously we saw him, but it's almost like he's gone better in a weird way. Um, Vadim Nemkov. These guys aren't free agents, so don't get crazy on me here. I'm um, just seeing like who are the, you know, let's be honest, the vast majority of the top tens are UFC guys. Renier Derrider. Hmm. Looking at the great MMA fighting rankings right now, Kayla will be at the top of the list, no doubt about it. I think we thought AJ McKee could be that guy. Yeah, I mean, he still could be that guy. That could be the second one on the list, to be honest. Kayla, AJ McKee. I'm not ready to give up on AJ at all. Lewis, back again with an abuse of power. How about that? My question is regarding UFC contracts and fighter retirement declarations slash declarations that they are finished. How does the UFC operate with such notice? It appears to differ from regular employment. You want to sign a deal in May. Historically, GSP was under contract for years during his hiatus and still had time left post his two. That was the initial story. Have I heard a ton from them? No. Did I hear a lot more in the beginning when I first reported about them in September? Yes. Did I have my doubts? Yes. Uh, is it February, 2023 yet? No, that's still eight months away. So let's see. But haven't heard a lot, if I'm being honest. Greetings from Berlin, from Bella. My question is whether it is a disservice to the featherweight division to let Bryce Mitchell and Evlov fight each other or not, because after Volk beats Hallway again, there are barely fights left to make. Would you go with me in recommending sending them on parallel pass? No. They could, they're could. they not two massive stars that you don't want to kill one off. You need to build one up. And I, and I still think there's guys like Arnold Allen out there. So I would book him. Wow. Uh, Ha'af Shelhelvani, that's Hebrew for Helwani knows, respect. And wrote it in Hebrew as well, Ha'af Shelhelvani. Af is knows Helvani, Helwani. Uh, hi, Ariel, Shalom from Toronto, Canada. Why do you think no other MMA promotion was able to replicate the UFC's uh, pay per view buy success? I believe no other promotion ever generated more than 100 to 150 pay per view buys, even with stack cards and big names. But did they have big names and stack cards? Do you see any non-UFC MMA card in the next few years generating 200,000 or more? No. First of all, you have to understand the UFC brand, those three letters, that's the biggest draw in the sport. Someone asked me this recently. Who's the biggest draw in the sport? I think it was on this show in this segment. And I said, UFC is probably, other than Connor, they're number one. It's probably Connor, then UFC. UFC, like I said earlier, has something that top rank, that Bellator, that PFL, that Matchroom, that Golden Boy, I'll wish they have, that only WWE has in combat sports, if you will. They could put on a show. They could say they're coming to Austin. They could say they're coming to the O2, that they're coming to the three arena or whatever, and sell it out based on the name alone because you know what you're getting with the UFC product to a degree. The glitz, the glamour, the somewhat big names and fights, depending on the show. Even if it's a pay-per-view, you are you know like you're, you know what you're getting. You're getting a title fight most likely. No one else has that. And that's the same thing for pay-per-view. No one else has that. So 
No, I don't think anyone could get that right now. And why is the UFC able to get it? Because they they are the gold standard. They've been around since 93. There wasn't, you know, there was a time when they weren't getting it. It doesn't happen overnight. Unlike pro wrestling, unlike AEW, you need the guys to go out there and win. The gals to go out there and win. So Sabatella could be someone, but he's got to go out there and win. It's not like you can just build up a young, you know, an MJF, a Thunder Road. No, they have to go out there and win. So it's a little tougher. You have to get lucky. You have to get the right matchups, the right stars, the right personalities. Bellator has been missing that. Um, PFL, I think, has a great thing with Kayla and some of the other people. WSOF had Gaethje and Marlon. No one that really got them over the hump, but they they were people that they were building. UFC has the name. They've got everything. They've got the TV deal. They have the distribution. And they have the benefit of the fact that everyone wants to go there. Everyone is striving to get there. Izzy wanted to go there. Um, Connor wanted to go there. So it's just a product of time. Amy, I was wondering what you thought about Zhang Wei Li trying to set the terms for a future matchup, even though she is only the challenger. I'm a fan of hers, but I think she already gets preferred treatment as a big part of the UFC expansion plan. It's also clear the crowd reaction factor is still in her head. Honestly, I mean, that's just her calling out. That's her just calling someone out. And Carla's going to come back and say, oh, you're not going to tell me what to do. Guess what? UFC's going to tell both of them what to do. So if she had a specific call out. Great. Love it. I don't think it's any more, any less. We all like when they do that. I don't think it's a sign of her getting a big head or getting too big for her britches. Not a big deal. Lewis, hi, Ariel. Luke Thomas posted a video breaking down your interview last week with Tim Kennedy. Just curious, when he broke it down, did he mention my name? Did he? I, I remember, I, you know, love Luke. We've we've buried the hatchet. One time when I was at ESPN, I did an interview with Connor. He broke the whole thing down. He posted like a 45-minute video about my interview and never referenced my name once. It was like some fictitious, mysterious, unknown figure that did the interview. I'd like to think that he did. It feels like the proper thing to do, but I didn't see this video. Uh, he broke down my interview with Tim Kennedy about why the Mixed Martial Arts Athletes Association failed. He believes the best solution to fix fighter pay might be turning MMA into boxing by expanding the Ali Act to MMA. Uh, yes, the MMA FA have been fighting for this specific thing. They believe strongly that expanding the Ali Act would help MMA tremendously. Can you please let us know if you agree that something like the Ali Act might be needed as someone who cares about fighter pay? This is from Lewis now. To summarize what Luke talked about, three different entities, the MMA AAA or the MM AAA PFA Project Spearhead um, have all tried to campaign for fighters' rights and we're all met with the same stumbling block Fighters might agree, but they're not going to sign due to fear of retribution. Luke posed the question, what is the way we can actually get fighters uh, protection in the industry, a lawsuit unionization, the Ali Act? Obviously, there's the class action lawsuit that could be huge, which may not necessarily lead to this, but could get you know the fighters a little bit of retribution, if you will. What will make the Ali Act a little tricky in this sport is that Bellator, UFC fighters are all like why I've I've campaigned for the UFC ones in particular because they are the creme de la creme. Because if you have if there's a system where someone who's a mainstay in the UFC goes and says we need because like USADA doesn't pertain to Bellator or PFL, the TV deals don't pertain to all of them. Um, the sponsorship thing doesn't pertain to all of them. It's very unique. So if you go in there. And you say like, hey, if you if we fight six times in the UFC, we're at a, thir a certain level. And if we fight 10 times, we get a, 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 a kind of pension and we get a 401k, I don't know, or we get a seat at the table, we get to not be drug tested. Or There's a million different things that are just exclusive and specific to the UFC. And that's why it feels like there has to be a UFC specific entity, association of sorts. Now, if there was a broader thing that protected all fighters like an Aliak, that would be tremendous. Of course, I would not argue against that. But I do believe in addition to that, there needs to be something specific to the UFC. Steven. Swazdi. Hello and Ty Ariel. First, I want to thank you for all the content. You've been a big part of me losing 160 pounds now or a full lightweight. Wow. As I listen to you during my workouts, still lots to go, but your entire team have been amazing to go above and beyond with these four hour shows. And I want to include everyone that assisted previously when you were with ESPN. I'll send that nice thank you once I hit 205 pounds. Wow. Great job, Stephen. One, 
Do you think Glover Teixeira calling out Jan Bohovic before his fight last weekend will now work against him? Allow for the number one contenders match to face the new champ and give Glover the fight he originally asked for after Jan won instead of the rematch. All the way from Thailand, let's go Blue Jays. Man, Blue Jays are great. They're finally putting it all together. Vladi is incredible. Uh, it's a joy to watch them play, although the Yankees are doing great as well. But still, I'm very, very high on the Jays. And I think they can make a run. I think they can make a run, even if they win the wild card and, and not the East. But damn, the East is, I mean, Yankees, how are they doing so damn good? Uh, no, I don't think that will bite him in the butt. I think it's going to come down to Jan or Glover. I can't really get a sense for which direction, but it sounds to me like Yuri wants Jan. So maybe they'll go in that direction. Uh, but I don't think that bites him in the butt. He was talking as champion. It's different. Dan. Hello, Ariel. I always feel as if I'm stuck with the idea that I want people to fight in the weight classes I've seen them thrive best in. To me, I want Dustin and Nate to fight at 55. Yeah, but you get older, it's hard to make that weight, especially for Nate. So that it holds implications for a title fight at 55. Same with McGregor. I have zero desire to see him fight Usman. Agreed. And same as Hamzad versus Nate, or even Colby versus anyone in 85. Don't necessarily agree with that. People move all the time. How do you feel about people jumping around weight classes for fights that really hold no implications on the ranking system? Sometimes it's weird. Like Nate versus Connor 2, I wish happened at 55, but I don't mind Colby losing two title fights and then going up, fresh coat of paint. So I think it's specific. Nate has fought at 70 a bunch. Don't hate it. Dustin, all right, fine. But if that's the only time, like the guys who aren't getting title shots that are just kind of there now because they're stuck because they lost to the champ, I don't mind it at all. Uh, just a few more left here. David, hey, Ariel, when you say we'll know about the Diaz future within the end of the month, is it likely a future where Diaz is still around with the UFC? Potentially. I feel like you could have been doing a read between the lines moment on Monday when you threw out the hypothetical Dustin versus Nate for August. Am I wrong on this? Maybe. Maybe not. I can't divulge at this moment. Wow, Frank, we've got breaking news. One of my favorite people who listen to the show, in fact, almost after every show, if not every show, the great Angela Higgins of Scotland always uh, posts that she's watching the show in Scotland. And Lewis tells me that this is Angela's first ever question for On the Nose. How about that? Angela's the best. Uh, hello, Ariel. We all know you're a fashion icon. Wow with your vast array of plaid shirts. Thank you. And the sneak peeks of sneakers and hoodies we see. Wow, that is so very kind of you. In fact, uh, yesterday uh, I went to my daughter's graduation. She had her pre-K graduation and I actually wore my Roots of Fight Bret the Hitman Hart jacket. And wow, I was the talk of the town. Everyone wanted to talk to me about Bret Hart. And wow, you're so cool. Look at you, you're wearing a Bret Hart. I was like, this is just a jacket. <laughs> you know, like this is just me like out of bed. <laughs> you know, I wasn't trying to make a statement here. <laughs> I was just trying to wear my cool jacket. That's it. But I appreciate the kind words. As a self-confessed sneakerhead, I'm interested to know what are some of your favorite sneakers? I got my first pair of Nike Dunks six months ago and I have to say they're not my faves. My current faves are Adidas superstars, but I flip-flop on various, excuse me, I flip-flop on favorites every few months. I'm strictly a Nike SB guy. I've always been a Nike SB guy for the past decade plus. Um, I've mentioned in the past, my favorite SBs are the Miss Pac-Mans. Uh, I like my Dilla Souls. I'm obviously, I, you know, honestly, I'm not like that big of a sneakerhead. Like I'm not one of these people who like wears the shoes once and never wears them again. I like to just wear them. I haven't, I used to go to flight club all the time. Do you uh, wear Jinkos? I don't know what that is. What's the, the big baggy pants? No. Uh, we were curious, but carry on. What do you mean? Like I, I, I rock the baggy pants with the uh, with the cargo thing on the side. Yeah, like yeah, I was into that. All right. I uh, wore the you know the backwards pants too. Crisscross will make you. Did you really? Of course. That's overalls? Pretty, Did you wear overalls? Yeah, but with both straps on. No, one. <laughs> of course. Who wears both? Um, anyway, love the SPs. Can I tell you something though? Sign of the times. Can I tell you what I'm really into these days? Please. All birds. The shoes. No? The shoes, yeah. yeah. Not just actual birds. Do you, have you ever tried <laughs> all birds? All, no, I've seen the ads. Oh my oh. God. 
It's literally... Wait, should I turn on the music? Is this an ad? No. Okay. It's literally like walking on clouds. They are amazing. If you have an opportunity to buy Allbirds, I could not vouch for them more. Some of my favorite shoes. But I never see you wear them. Nah, I have a few. It's more like when I have to dress up a little bit. I do like my SBs for doing the show because they're just there. Um, and honestly, I have way more shoes. I, I, I basically will wear one for a long period of time. I'll kill it, and then I'll move on to the next. Makes sense. But yeah, SBs are my favorite. I like the fat tongue. Olajuwon, good afternoon, Ariel. If there was one event, doesn't have to be MMA, that you didn't get to see live in person but wish you could have, which one would it be? Have a great day and show. Easy question for me. I've thought about it a lot. Game 7, 1970 NBA Finals, May 8th, 1970, Madison Square Garden, the Willis Reed game. He walks out. Here comes Willis, and the crowd goes wild. He makes his first two shots. Knicks, Lakers, Knicks roll, win their first championship. If I could go back to one sporting event over time, it would be that game, Game 7, MSG, May 8th, 1970, to see my beloved New York Knicks win their very first championship. I'd love to see it. Uh, Caleb, any idea which direction they're heading with Hamzat? I feel like now that Usman Leon is official, we should see something soon. Nate, Bilal, Colby. I have a hard time uh, seeing Colby at the moment, if only because he has that legal thing brewing. Uh, I think Nate is still in play. I think Bilal is somewhat in play. I think we jumped the gun a little bit last week as a collective unit and um, with the Bilal stuff, maybe to get us excited. But I could see them doing it, and I don't mind it. So it seems like maybe a two-horse race there. Nothing imminent. Uh, I think we'll see him in Abu Dhabi. And by the way, I think Abu Dhabi could come sooner than we think. Maybe, let's talk crazy, don't freaking make 900 posts about this, but am hearing potentially could be September as opposed to October. There's a few pieces, like they're figuring it out. So everyone just relax. Uh, Viva Frank GC New York Rick and Mr. 10-7. No question, this is from Jason, but I do have two comments. MMA Book Club is a grand salami. Oh my God, that was hilarious. Get it going ASAP and make Frank the president. Frank, would you like to be the president of the MMA Book Club? I accept. I loved watching that dream come to fruition on the last show. Outstanding work, gentlemen. Last thing, screw whoever has a problem with the guest choices. Keep the new guys rolling in, of course, but we need the old school guys also. Tim Kennedy, my goodness, what a legend. Great interview, great angle, touching other topics, intertwining back together with the MMA community. What a badass. Get older fighters on. Honor the legends like you always say the UFC fails to do, which is true. These guys paved the way and deserve more respect and exposure. Great work, Ariel, to you and your whole team. Thank you so much for all you guys do, bringing the people what they want. You're a man of the people, the people's champ. Cheers, Jason. Wow. What a comment. That was amazing. By the way, one thing I love about this show and I've always loved about the show, like even today, we went to Perth, we went to St. Louis, that's where Thunder Rosa was, but then we went to Czech Republic, then we went to Brazil, then we went to Italy with Danny Sabatel. It's amazing how the world is so big, but here on this show, I mean, there is no more global show with global guests like this show. I would say in all of sports. Is there any show in sports where you'll hear from someone in Perth and then go to Brazil, and then go to the Czech Republic. I mean, it's crazy. Constantly, twice a week. Can't stop till the break of dawn. Won't stop. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Uh, two more. Sunny. Yo, Ariel, besides making sure the right people get included, what changes would you make for an international MMA Hall of Fame? Example, I think Ronda Rousey deserves a spot in the pioneer wing rather than the modern wing. I wouldn't do this pioneer modern nonsense. Just the Hall of Fame. They're in. If they're in, they're in, and Ronda would be a Hall of Famer. Also, when does modern end? Does it become postmodern? You're, you're overthinking it. Just if they make it, they make it. Modern, postmodern, mo pioneer, this, that. It's too much. Uh, but yes, please. Did you see the scene in Canastota this past weekend? Three classes coming together. Legends like Bernard Hopkins and Andre Ward and Floyd Mayweather and Holly Holm and Christy Martin. It was just amazing. Lou DiBella, amazing. Okay, last one. Jesus. Phenomenal day to you, Mr. Hawani. Nothing but the utmost appreciation to you and your team. As our show ending streak continues, on Monday's show, you gave us a brief insight on how your recent situation has tested your parenting abilities. Being parents to multiple children is a full-time job, let alone trying to do it as the only parent. God bless. I consistently make efforts to make sure I provide my share, if not more of the child rearing because I know that sharing this labor is fundamental to good parenthood, even if 
the work can be absolutely draining. I have a three-parter for you here. When you think back, when your children were small, they kind of still are, I mean, 10, eight, and five. Uh, but all right, uh, would you say the division of labor between your partner and yourself was shared evenly or was one parent responsible for more child rearing than the other? Also, has your recent experience made you appreciate your child care even more? And what advice would you give to young parents, especially fathers regarding this matter? Best regards and long live Helwani, Jesus Alvarez, fellow proud father and dadvocate, which is an advocator for being a good dad. God bless. Um, listen, women have a way tougher job than us, especially in the early days when the child is born. Like our, our sole job is to be helpful, be present, but mainly get out of the way. Now, my wife was great. Like she wanted to do everything. She never complained. She never said, oh, you get up, you do this. Like she loved it. And it was amazing to see her evolve into a mother. Again, I met her when we were just classmates and then you know, we were boyfriend, girlfriend, then fiance, then, 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 then wife, then like we've, we've been through a lot together. So I've seen that evolution. It's been wonderful, but like she's getting, she's doing like 98% of the work. I'm just trying not to screw things up as things get older now, like soccer sport. I do that stuff. Cause I love doing that stuff. In fact, my son has a football game, which I'm probably going to miss because it's at six o'clock. All good. These are the sacrifices we make. Point is as they grow up, you kind of start to take your, you know, she's here, she's with them now, I'm not. I travel, she's there, she travels. You know, like, it just kind of falls into place. No one's sitting there being like, all right, you did this, thank you very much, I'm going to do that, you did this. It just kind of, it just happens. Uh, but yes, I mean, being alone with the kids, it wasn't a chore, it wasn't a bad thing. You're just tired. Like, you can't take a break and go do work and go do this, you know. Um, but we have help. Uh, you wish that you had more, you know, I, I, I am envious of the people who live with their grand, you know, the same city as grandparents. We don't have that. Um, so that would be great. You probably don't go out as much cause you don't have someone staying over to babysit and all this stuff, but it takes a village, it takes a village. Amen, Frank. It takes a village, but it's a beautiful thing. And I was watching my daughter graduate yesterday and they're growing up so fast. And I feel like they've grown up, even though you don't really know them on this show, you know, you uh, most of you, the old time fans, remember when my first son was born ten years ago, and the second one, New York Rick took over for the third one. Uh, when you know the third one was born, that's when he took over that one show. And it's just, it's all going by so fast. But there's nothing I would rather be doing more. There's nothing I would rather do than be with them, than be around them, than help them, than guide them. Um, it's just, it's, it's the greatest. I can't vouch for it enough. Parenthood, in my opinion, is the absolute best. And I feel very lucky. Two boys, a girl, I feel like I have it all. I'm a rich man. As the great, uh, as the great Bob Marley once said when he was asked about, you know, if he considers himself a rich man. Do you know this quote, Frank, about Bob Marley? Yeah, but go on. You know it? I'm guessing not. Well, you just said, yeah. Well, it sounded familiar and now I'm second guessing myself. I love this quote. The one that you're having to look up. Well, no, I'm 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 uh, gonna play it for you real quick. Okay, thank you. Because uh, I've played it on my birthday, because it puts it all into perspective. I actually saw it for the first time a few days before my first son was born. I was watching the Bob Marley documentary. Have you seen the Bob Marley documentary? I haven't. You haven't seen it? It was on Netflix. Well, actually, like ten years ago. So. Um, Wait for it, because I think I needed it. Oh, wait, is this it? No. Wait for it. Wait, I want I want to play it now. Oh, wait, wait, wait for it. Wait for it. The anticipation is overwhelming. Wait for it. Oh, man, I screwed this up, didn't I? Frank, I screwed it up. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait, Frank. Just Can you just wait for it? Wait for it. How long is this going to go? Oh, here's a good. Here it is. This is the Bob Marley quote. Do you make a lot of money out of your music? Money. I mean, what is, how, much is, how much is a lot of money to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Have, have you made, say, millions of dollars? No. Are you a rich man? What do you mean, rich? What do you mean? You have a lot of possessions, a lot of oh. money in the bank. Possession make you rich? I don't, I don't have that type of richness. My richness is life forever. 
Wow, what a quote. Did you hear that? Were you able to hear yeah, that? Yeah, and I have heard that before. At he least doesn't... Have, his, his possessions don't make you rich. His richness was life. And that's how I feel. My richness is life. Uh, so I feel, I feel very blessed. Very, very blessed. Danny Sabatello and I, we both agree. We don't need the money. Our richness is life. God bless. All right, Frank. Uh, I think that's a good way to end today's program. Thank you to everyone who sent in questions. Thank you to the great Lewis, the moderator, for his great job once again. Again, I apologize. We're off next week. It's a national holiday, Juneteenth, uh, next Monday. Uh, it is being observed on Monday. And then uh, I'm going to be seeing, God bless, hopefully my family. Remember in April, I told you all that I was going and then COVID struck the Hawani household, unfortunately. So knock on wood, we'll make it up there and uh, it will be a great time. No better time to be in Montreal than around that time. And it's been long overdue. I always tell you guys, oh, we're going, we're going. <laughs> Almost a year away is just too much. Life is too short to be away for so long. So I hope that if you are within driving or flying distance from your loved ones, you're able to see them now uh, more so than the last two years because it's been difficult. If you don't live in the same city as your family, it's been difficult for sure. Great show. Love today's show. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much to all our guests. Thank you to the crew in the back. Thank you to GC uh, over in uh, Italy. Thank you to his girlfriend as well for assisting with the videos thank you for going above and beyond appreciate that very very much and uh, hopefully you guys all make a lot of money and we shall talk about it all not next week but in two weeks again the 27th we shall be back want to thank all our guests this week as always tremendous stuff uh don giacomo della madalena tremendous stuff from him uh how about thunder rosa thank you very much to her as well and good luck with the uh charity yuri prochaska good luck to him tyler santos Congrats to her on a great performance. And Danny Sabatello, well done, my friend. What a first appearance. Back in two weeks and time and place. Until then, we say peace. We're out of here.